bring commission meeting to order. I want to welcome everybody to the call. Uh, I want to thank the commissioners for your, your patience as we work through um, doing this by teleconference. Um, and um, it, it means a lot to me that, that everybody is so willing to do that. And I know it takes a little longer because of roll call votes and, and other things, but um, I feel like the director and I feel like um, it's been going really well in the vice chair. So we appreciate that. Um, and so our next, uh, our first order of business is to um, do roll call. And so we'll go through and do roll call. Uh, and But before we do roll call, just a few housekeeping items that I want to remind uh, the commissioners and the council members and, and everyone on the call is to make sure for the call to go smooth to mute your line when you're not. You mute your line and you can do that um, through the app and it, it will be a slash across the microphone when you are muted and then, um, so I appreciate everybody doing that. Also, when um, just out of um, clarification for everyone listening uh, and the commissioners, when we say raise your hand, that's your icon hand uh, in the app. And so um, you can raise your hand to try to get my attention or you can speak up to unmute yourself and speak up and all. We'll make sure we go slow. We don't want um, we want everybody to be able to um, be heard on on issues. So. Um, I appreciate everybody joining us. And so our first order of business is, is roll call. And so uh, when I say your name, just say that you're present. And so we'll start off. Commissioner Blackshear. Present. Commissioner, Vice Chair Farr. Vice Chair Farr. Present. <laughs> Commissioner Haynes. Present. Commissioner Johnson. Present. Commissioner Lawson. Present. Councilor Murphy. Present. Commissioner Sims. Present. Commissioner Tibbs. Don't. I don't believe I saw Commissioner Tibbs, so nine members present. I'm present as well. And so, uh, Mr. Chairman, this is Ron Gobble. Did you call my name? Yes, yes. Commissioner Gobble, are you present? Uh, barely, <laughs> but I'm here. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, sir. We appreciate it. Welcome, everybody. Um, so now we are on to the next item, which is we need to establish um, the authority um, and vote on having an actual telephonic meeting. And so I'll call on our attorney, and I believe Quan is on the line, I believe. Quan, you recognize. Yes, yes, thank you, Chairman. Um, as you all know, uh, state and local law requires that um, all of the government business be done in the public. However, uh, due to the ongoing uh, global pandemic re related to the COVID-19, most uh, there are limits on the amount of people who can congregate in one particular place. And the governor has instituted executive orders that will allow boards and commissions and other government agents to do their essential business remotely, either telephonically or electronically. Uh, however, in order to do that, there must be a vote that has to take place. Uh, the board must find uh, two things. One, that the business that it is going to carry out is essential business. And then two, that conducting the meeting uh, remotely is necessary to protect the health and well-being of Tennesseans. And so if you do those two things, it will allow this body to proceed uh, with the remote meeting. So the chair should um, solicit a vote to that effect, a motion to that effect. Thank you, Quan. And um, obviously um, we have a pandemic on our hands. Uh, 
in Nashville and Tennessee and worldwide. Um, the governor issued the order, and so the motion would be uh, that uh, is that the meeting electronically is necessary to protect the health, safety, and welfare of Tennesseans in light of the COVID-19 outbreak. Any planning rules that are in conflict with the governor's order are hereby temporarily suspended until the governor's order is no longer in effect. And so we'll need someone to make that motion. And so Vice Chair Farr, you want to make the motion? Can I just make the motion that you just stated so I don't have yes. to state it all again? Yes, that would be the motion. Yeah, I will make, make a motion to that effect. Thank you, Vice Chair. Council Lady Murphy, you want to second it? Second. Excellent. And is there any discussion if the commissioners would raise your hand or verbally state you want to discuss? And seeing none, we are on the roll call to allow for a telephonic meeting. Commissioner Blackshear. Aye. Vice Chair Farr. Aye. Commissioner Gobble. Aye. Commissioner Haynes. Aye. Commissioner Johnson. Aye. Commissioner Lawson. Aye. Council Lady Murphy. Aye. Commissioner Sims. Aye. And I do not believe that Commissioner Tibbs is on the line yet, so he will be joining us later. Commissioner Tibbs is letting me know he's having, forgive me, this is Lucy, sorry to interrupt. Commissioner Tibbs is trying to call in, so I'm uh, texting ITS and Ms. Shepard with his cell, so hopefully they can coordinate, but I'll let you know once he's, he's on. Excellent. Eyes have it and we are having a telephonic meeting. And now our, our next uh, agenda item is the adoption of the agenda, which was sent out earlier to the commissioners. And we will need a motion to adopt the agenda. Move to approve. That's a proper motion. Is there a second? I second it. Excellent, thank you for seconding. And any other discussion on the agenda? or any questions or edits, if you'll raise your icon hand or verbally let me know. Seeing none, we are ready for a roll call vote on the adoption of the agenda. And Commissioner Blackshear. Aye. Vice Chair Farr. Aye. Commissioner Gobble. Commissioner Gobble. We'll come back to Commissioner Gobble. Commissioner Haynes? Aye. Commissioner Johnson? Aye. Commissioner Lawson? Aye. Council Lee Murphy? Aye. Commissioner Sims? Aye. Commissioner Gobble? I know he's muted, but I know he's an I. He's, will, Commissioner Gobble? Eyes have it. I believe Commissioner Gobble is an eye. He is still not, he's still muted. Eyes have it, the agenda is adopted. So now we are on to item D, which is the um, approval of the August 27th, 2020 minutes. Those were also sent out prior to the meeting. Um, are there, We'll need a motion to approve. Vice Chair Farr, you want to make a motion to approve the minutes? I will make a motion to approve the minutes. All right, is there, and who would like to make a second? And Commissioner Johnson, would you like to second that? Thank you, Chair, I second the motion. It's a proper motion, any other discussion? We'll go slow, make sure. And Anybody have any questions under discussion? Any discussion, if you'll raise your icon or verbally state you would like to discuss. And I don't see any raising of the hands. So we are ready to vote on the minutes and we'll do roll call vote. Commissioner Blackshear. Aye. Commissioner Farr. Vice Chair Farr. Aye. Commissioner Gobble. Commissioner Gobble's having trouble. Uh, he's going to log back on. Sorry to interrupt again. Okay, no problem. Commissioner Haynes. Aye. Commissioner Jones. 
Aye. Commissioner Lawson. Aye. Council Lady Murphy. Aye. Council Lady Murphy. Rebels, you. Aye. There we go. Commissioner Sims. Aye. And let's see if Commissioner Tibbs is on. I don't think he is yet. So ayes have it, and the minutes are adopted. Now we are on to the recognition of the council members, and um, we just call on the the. I want to welcome all the council members and council members to the meeting, and we call on them as as we see them pop up in the app, uh, just like we do at the meeting when we see them. And so first was. Um, I believe Councilman Withers I saw first. So Councilman Withers, you're on the line. Welcome. Uh, thank you so much, Chair Adkins. Um, uh, I am just want to speak really briefly uh, on item number 12, which is an SP amendment for South 13th Street. Um, that item, I believe, is uh, remains on the consent agenda, which I am grateful for that. Um, uh, I've sent a letter which should be in your packets and is also posted to the website, kind of giving some background on this and, and my uh, appreciation for the staff recommendation uh, of, of approval with some conditions that I think are beneficial. Uh, this is a, an SP that actually inherited. My predecessor had uh, approved an SP for a single lot in a residential area. Um, and he did so with good intentions and with a good plan, which was that if new infill development was going to happen, that an SP would provide some certainty to the community uh, that that new infill development would um, match the, the context as closely as possible. Um, uh, however, you know, single lot rezones can sometimes be controversial, and that is the exact reason why I do not bring single lot zone changes in residential areas to the community. Um, in this particular case, the applicant is actually wanting to retain the existing home, and rather than demolish that existing home and, and build a, a new construction duplex, which is to retain the existing structure facing 13th Street and add that second unit in the rear, it is a corner lot, there's an existing sidewalk, um, and the, the conditions to limit height and provide screening that uh, staff recommended are all beneficial. Uh, so um, I do request approval. I know we've had a little bit of community discussion. That particular neighborhood association, the Shelby Hills Neighborhood Association, has not really been meeting even electronically uh, during the COVID um, pandemic that, the, that we're in. So. Uh, uh, assuming that it remains on consent for approval, which I do recommend, um, I will make sure to have some additional time to speak with uh, the neighbors before this would come before council for, to address any remaining questions. But otherwise, I appreciate the, uh, the applicant for bringing a sensitive amendment uh, to the staff for providing very detailed and thoughtful analysis uh, and to you commissioners for your consideration of this subject. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman. Appreciate the, the kind words um, and uh, you working on this particular issue. Very helpful. Thank you. And it is, uh, I do see it on consent. Um, we are now, I believe, I saw Councilman Hager on the line. Good evening. How's everybody doing today? Doing I've great, got, Councilman. Good. I've got. Uh, Number 13 is the Tula Grove townhomes. We continued it last time to, uh, there was gonna be another entrance on Tula Grove Road. There was concerns about that. Uh, I sent pictures in to them. They're gonna ask for a waiver from uh, stormwater uh, because I took pictures over there when it rained real hard for about two or three hours and sent those in. It's my understanding they're still going to try to do that. I believe it's still on consent, but I'm not sure it was last time I looked it up. Am I correct? You are correct. Okay. And then I believe, the, yes. Yeah. So they're going, to, they're going to ask for a waiver on that. So because when I had the community meeting, that was the plan was to have an entrance on Lee Sand Lane and Tula Grove Road uh, that runs partially through a floodplain, but I've took pictures and sent those in to storm water uh, to show them how the water 
and it rained real hard over there um, that uh, it wasn't a big problem. So hopefully they can get the waiver. On 22, which is the forward subdivision, that's the one we continued last time. So the present homeowners on that road could discuss with the owners, uh, being in the HOA that they've already got down there, I believe. So that is not a rezoning. Uh, they're just dividing that up into certain lots across the road from them. So I don't know whether I need to stay on here for that or not, since it's not a rezoning at all. Uh, that, that would be up to you, Councilman. I, I do know, I believe that that item 22 uh, and the director or Lisa can correct me if I'm wrong, but we'll, we will hear that case tonight. We'll hear that. Okay. Well, yes. Hi, Chairman. This is Lisa. We will hear, hear that item. It is a subdivision request. Got it. Yep. That's what I thought. And so, so Councilman, you know, I, how many letters have we, Lisa, let's add, let me ask you this. How many letters have we gotten on that particular item? Hi, Chairman. We actually have not received any letters. I believe we received one phone call in advance of the last meeting, which is why it's being presented. Okay. Okay. Then, you know, that's, that's a private deal, I guess, between the HOA and the lots across the street. Um, so... I'm going to let them uh, discuss that and if they can work it out, that's great. Otherwise, uh, I'm going to leave unless y'all want me to stay, but I think I'll just bow out since that's a private situation uh, and it's not a rezoning. Okay. Thank you, uh, Councilman. We appreciate it. I thank y'all for letting me speak. Have a good day. Thank you, sir. Bye-bye. Next, uh, we have uh, Councilman Rosenberg. Uh, saw you're online yeah thank you thank you chairman uh and thank you commissioners appreciate your time um speaking on item 21 which is the south harpeth farms regulatory sp uh, it would allow the development of single family homes uh, i know that planning staff has concerns regarding this and there'll be some loose ends to tie up um, especially as it relates to south harpeth road but generally i'm very happy that this is being proposed as a strictly residential development that will preserve the vast majority of this land uh, 700 plus acres in perpetuity uh, there's a lot of concern within my district or opposition really to the idea of commercial development uh, extending to more rural areas particularly up river road and also here on highway 100 west of the natchez trace so I'm glad to see a proposal that will protect the area from non-residential, non-agricultural uses that are permitted under AR2A zoning and also protect the area from non-residential uses that could be proposed as a part of a future rezoning and a future term. Um, the proposal also dedicates land for a future fire station in an area that badly needs a closer fire station. The closest one is 15 minutes really without traffic, and then it's another 10 to 15 minutes to the county line. Uh, and it also calls for improvements to a variety of intersections with Highway 100 uh, that come in at all sorts of wonky areas and unsafe ways. Um, my sense is that there's no further progress to be made uh, as far as approval versus disapproval. Uh, so I'd ask that the Planning Commission take action this evening, uh, whatever action you see fit to take. And I thank you very much for your time and also for your service. Thank you, Councilman. Appreciate uh, you joining us. And let's see, and Lisa or Director, is you. Are there any other council members? I don't think I see any others. I don't see any others. So, I do not see any others. Okay, and we'll watch for uh, council members as we always like to be extremely respectful to the council members, even has been council members. That's for all you have has been council members out there like me. Anyway, we are now on to items for deferral, which is item F. And Lisa, are you gonna lead us through the items for deferral or withdrawal? I am indeed. 
Um, okay, so we have the following items for deferral or withdrawal. Item number one on page four of your agenda, 2020 SP 037001, 1414 3rd Avenue North. Staff recommendation is to defer to the September 24th Planning Commission meeting. Item number two, 2019 S 086001, the resubdivision of lots three and four on the plat showing the division of the John B. Cowden property. Staff recommendation is to defer to the September 24th meeting. Item number three, 2019 S 234001 on page five of your agenda. The Doral property subdivision. Staff recommendation is to defer to the September 24th Planning Commission meeting. Item number four, 2020 S 113-001. It's a resubdivision of lots 8A and 8B on the resub of lot A on the plat of Dixie Pure Food Company subdivision. Staff recommendation is to defer to the September 24th Planning Commission meeting. Item number five, 2020 S 140-001, Hobson Pike Town Townhomes. Staff recommendation is to defer to the September 24th Planning Commission meeting. Item number six, 2020 S 145-001, the Bordeaux Agrihood. Staff recommendation is to defer to the September 24th Planning Commission meeting. Item number seven, 2020Z071PR001. Staff, this is a rezoning request on Old Hickory Boulevard. Staff recommendation is to defer indefinitely. Item number eight on page six of your agenda, 2020Z096PR001. It's a request to rezone from RS20 to RM20 on Chadwell Drive. Staff recommendation is to defer to the September 24th Planning Commission meeting. Item number nine, substitute BL202197. Staff recommendation is to defer to the November 12th Planning Commission meeting. Item number 10, 2019 SP009001, Charlotte Pike SP. Staff recommendation is to defer indefinitely. Item number 11, 2020 SP 015001, the Hamilton SP. Staff recommendation is to defer to the September 24th Planning Commission meeting. Item number 19, 2020Z102 PR001 on page eight of your agenda. It's a request to rezone from CS and MUL to MULANS for a property located on Martin and Humphrey Street. Staff recommendation is to defer to the September 24th Planning Commission meeting. And I would note that Commissioner Blackshear is recusing herself from that item. Item number 20, 2020Z103 PR001. Uh, it's a request to rezone from RS10 to R8A for property located on River Drive. Staff recommendation is to defer to the September 24th Planning Commission meeting. And item number 26 on page nine of your agenda, the commercial PUD periodic review. Staff recommendation is to defer to the October 8th Planning Commission meeting. Thank you, Lisa. And so we'll uh, go through these items slow. Commissioners, you've heard these and Lisa, let me know if this is correct, but these are the items for deferral withdrawal. Items number one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 19, 20, and 26. Is that correct, Lisa? Uh, that is correct. Thank you. Commissioners, you've heard the items for deferral withdrawal, and we will need a motion to approve those items to be deferred or withdraw. Vice Chair Farr, would you like to make a motion? Sure, I will make a motion that we approve this list of items for deferral or withdrawal. Thank you. And Commissioner Lawson, would you like to second it? So move, second. All right, thank you, sir. It's a proper motion and second. Any discussion? You'll raise your icon hands or verbally state that you want to discuss. And seeing no commissioners raising their hands, so we are on roll call for the items for defer. So roll call, Commissioner Blackshear. Aye. Vice Chair Farr. Aye. Commissioner Gobble. Aye. Commissioner Haynes. Aye. Commissioner Johnson. Aye. Commissioner Lawson. Aye. Council Lady Murphy. Aye. 
Commissioner Sims. Aye. And Commissioner Tibbs. I don't think Commissioner Tibbs is online and the ayes have it and those items are, are deferred. And I uh, totally forgot, not so rude of me. I just wanna say welcome back, Commissioner Sims. Uh, we're glad you're to have you back uh, on the planning commission with us uh, from your your job duties, your, your day job duties. So welcome back. Thank welcome you, sir. Back. All right, so now we are on the consent agenda item G uh, on the agenda and Lisa, I believe you're gonna take us through the consent agenda items. As information for our audience, if you are not satisfied with the decision made by the planning commission today, you may appeal the decision by petitioning for a writ of cert with the Davidson County Chancery or Circuit Court your appeal must be filed within 60 days of the date of the entry of the Planning Commission's decision. To ensure that your appeal is filed in a timely manner and that all procedural requirements have been met, please be advised that you should contact independent legal counsel. As additional notice to the public, items on, our, on the consent agenda will be voted on at a single time. No individual public hearing will be held, nor will the Commission debate these items unless a member of the commission requests that the item be removed from the consent agenda. The following items are on the consent agenda. Item number 12, 2015 SP 024002 on page six of your agenda, 620 South 13th Street amendment. It's a request to amend a specific plan for property located on, on South 13th Street to permit two residential units and all uses allowed under R6 zoning. Staff recommendation is to approve with conditions and disapprove without all conditions, including an updated requirement for a B landscape buffer to screen the parking from the adjacent street. Item number 13, 2020 SP 035001 on page seven of your agenda, Tulip Grove Townhomes. It's a request to rezone from R10 to SP for property located on Tulip Grove Road to permit 58 multifamily units. Staff recommendation is to approve with conditions and disapprove without all conditions. And I would note that Commissioner Blackshear is recusing herself from that item. Item number 14, 2020 SP 0390001, uh, 6001 and 6003 O'Brien Avenue. It's a request to rezone from R8 to SV for properties located on O'Brien Avenue to permit seven multifamily units. Staff recommendation is to approve with conditions and disapprove without all conditions. Item number 15, 2020S 147001. It's the resubdivision of part of lot 11 on the plan of the Curtis lands. It's a request for final plat approval to create three lots on property located on Lloyd Avenue. Staff recommendation is to approve with conditions. Item number 16, 2020Z099PR001. It's a request to rezone from CS and R6 to MULANS for property located on 3rd Avenue South. Staff recommendation is to approve. Item number 17, 2020Z100PR001. It's a request to rezone from RS10 to R6A for property located on Old Buena Vista Road. Staff recommendation is to approve. Item number 18 on page eight of your agenda, 2020Z101PR001. It's a request to rezone from IWD to MUGANS for property located on 8th Avenue South. Staff recommendation is to approve. And under other business, item number 30 to accept the director's report. Thank you, Lisa. And so commissioners, the items for the consent agenda and Lisa, make sure these are correct, are items number 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, and 30. Is that correct? Yes, Chairman, that's correct. Excellent. Commissioners, you've heard those items to be uh, approved on the consent agenda tonight. And Vice Chair, you want to make a motion to approve? Make a motion to approve the consent agenda. And it's a proper motion. And who wants to make a, Commissioner Sims, you want to make a second? 
I second it. Uh, thank you, Commissioner. And proper motion second. Any discussion? You'll raise your icon hand or verbally state you would like to discuss. And I'm looking for the icon hand, seeing none. So we are seeing no other discussion. We're ready for the roll call vote. And we will start with Commissioner Blackshear. Aye. Vice Chair Farr. Aye. Commissioner Gobble. Aye. Commissioner Haynes. Aye. Commissioner Johnson. Aye. Commissioner Lawson. Aye. Councilor Murphy. Council Lady Murphy. I'm sorry, I've got some technical difficulties, but I vote aye. Commissioner Sims. Aye. Commissioner Tibbs. Aye. Welcome, Commissioner Tibbs. You're present. Thank you. Sorry you were having difficulties getting on the line. Appreciate you joining us. Ayes have it, and the consent agenda is adopted. Now we are on to um, moving on to items to be considered uh, public for public hearing, um, which is item H. Um, and so in this portion of our meeting uh, for listeners at home, we've provided multiple ways for you to participate in our telephonic meeting. Normally we take the applicant first, then the supporters, then the opponents, but because of the different ways that people can participate telephonically, um, we'll be taking supporters and opponents together. So make sure that you um, state whether you're for or opposed to um, an item. And to help us, please state your name uh, and your address uh, uh, for the record. We appreciate that. As usual, uh, we took email comments through Tuesday at 3 p.m. Um, and at each uh, start of each public hearing item tonight. Lisa will give a summary of how many email comments uh, that we received on those particular items. We also have a call-in number for the public who wish to call in and testify. Um, and so please wait until the public hearing starts for that particular item and then call in. Um, it's a queue, so you don't have to wait. You just call in immediately so we can place you in the queue. Um, and when it's your turn, we will place you into the call. If you're calling, also please be aware that there is a legally required 30 second delay, which is kind of weird, I know, but that means that if you watch your screen while commenting, what you will see is actually slightly behind you. Um, so it works best to focus just on what you're saying, not watching the, um, the television uh, in your screen while, while you're talking. Uh, for each item, uh, we'll let you know when to call in, and we'll ask Lisa for, um, like I said, for the um, email uh, comments to those particular items. Um, and we also um, make sure we give you enough time to call in, and so we look forward to hearing those particular uh, uh, items. And so tonight, I believe, and Lisa, uh, make sure I'm correct, on this, but I believe after the deferral and withdrawals and the consent agenda, we are list, we are going to consider items 21, 22, 23, 24, and 25. Is that correct, Lisa? Hi, Chairman, that is correct. Excellent, well, let's go ahead and get started. And so we... Chairman, this is Chairman. This is Lucy. I, forgive me for um, for interrupting. I wanted to ask the call center um, just to reinforce the guidance that um, Chairman Atkins just expressed about only calling in on the item that's being heard. I, I believe we're getting callers now on the Federal Reserve case, and we we have two cases to hear before that, and need to give the public opportunities to speak to that. So, would you mind just just so that the folks who are calling in can hear this, um, reinforcing that one more time, Chair? Would you want Sean to the call center to to yes. give that guidance so, one more time? So it's so let me go a little slower. So it, it's very important to call only during your particular item that you're concerned about. OK. 
Can everybody hear me still? Can yes, we can hear you, Chairman. Okay, perfect. So the um, for the public out there. So we we're 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 hearing item number twenty one first, and we have five items that we're hearing. Um, I believe that the um, there's a lot of public comment on the, the Federal Reserve Building, which is item number 23. So we're only taking call calls on item 21 when we're on that particular item. So when we get to the item, it will pop up on the screen, and that's when to call in, and we will we will tell you when we're on each of those particular items. James, have you done your homework? Have you read? Okay. All right. So we are on to... Uh, item 21. Director Kemp, is that a good enough explanation? Yes, I believe it is. Thank you so much. Excellent. Thank you for clearing that up. I know that that particular item, there's a lot of interest in it. So we're on item number 21, which is the South Harpeth Farms SP. Okay. Hi, everybody. Um, it's Abby Rickoff. Can y'all hear me okay? Yes. Hi, Abby. Welcome. Hi. Thank you. Um, so this item is number 21, uh, the South Harpeth Farms SP. Next slide. This is a request to rezone from AR2A, um, which is agricultural residential, and single-family residential, RF40 and RFE, to a specific plan zoning for various properties located at South Harpeth Road, Griffith Road, Lewis Road, Highway 100, and Old Harding Pike to permit a maximum of 506 single family lots, religious institution, Greenway Park, agricultural activity, cemetery, safety services, a ponder lake, and associated accessory uses. Next slide. Staff recommendation is to disapprove. The site comprises several parcels on approximately 1,119 acres located north of Highway 100, um, spanning uh, from South Harpeth Road uh, at the west to Lewis Road to the east, and then northward to Griffith Road. Most of the properties are vacant, except for one of the parcels, uh, which contains a residential use. The site is largely undisturbed and features heavy tree canopy upon numerous streams that bisect the site, and a typographical pattern of ridges and valleys. Next slide. Approximately 287 acres are zoned AR2A, 14 acres are zoned RS40, and 818 acres are zoned RS80. The surrounding area is largely rural with irregularly shaped single-family parcels and vacant properties. One of the adjacent parcels to the west contains a cemetery, and there are a couple of scattered uh, two-family uses to the south near Highway 100. Next slide. The plan proposes a maximum of 506 single-family lots, religious institution, greenway, park, agricultural activity, cemetery, safety services, pond or lake, and associated accessory uses. Accessory uses include accessory apartment, garage sale, home occupation, leasing and sales office, stable, daycare home, community gardening, uh, and a rural bed and breakfast homestay. The plan is a regulatory plan and includes development standards rather than a traditional site plan, which would include an overall design and site layout. Um, the plan identifies access, uh, proposed access points at Griffith Road, Highway 100, and South Harpeth Road where the red circles are located. Uh, the plan also identifies two acres at the front of the site to be dedicated uh, for a future fire station near Highway 100. Uh, this would be dedication of a site only and it would not be construction of a station. Emergency access is proposed through an access easement on the adjacent cemetery to the west. The site is located in the Harpeth Valley Utility District. Harpeth Valley has confirmed an extension of the public sewer system will be required to connect to the site. Next slide. The 
The site is located in the T2RM Rural Maintenance Policy, which is identified in the lighter shade of green, and Conservation Policy, which is identified in, in the medium shade of green. Uh, conservation Policy at this site recognizes streams and stream buffers, uh, significant areas of slopes greater than 20%, a pond or lake, um, buffer, problem soils, potential wetlands and floodplain, and associated stormwater regulation buffers. As you can see, most of the site is located in the conservation policy area, identifying sensitive features that are prevalent throughout the site. The areas that are not encumbered by sensitive features are identified as within the T2RM policy area, which is intended for very low density residential development that is meant to reflect uh, the existing character. Within T2 rural areas, the primary intent of conservation policy is preservation rather than remediation. Of the total site acreage, staff has calculated approximately 900 acres um, located in the CO policy area, so the conservation policy and the darker shade of green, and 219 acres uh, in the T2RM policy area, the lighter shade of green. Next slide. While it may be possible to develop the site sensitively in a manner that is consistent with policy guidance, staff has the following fundamental concerns about how this can be achieved under the current scope. On the next several slides, I will review staff's concerns related to three key topics, development entitlements, land use policy, and the sewer policy. Next slide. Beginning with development entitlements, when evaluating reason requests, staff considers the appropriateness of the request against the land use policy, the surrounding context, and the maximum entitlements that could be permitted uh, to understand the opportunities or trade-offs a rezone might present versus subdividing under the existing entitlements and the requirements of the subdivision regulations. Maximum entitlement determinations are derived from the base zoning, total site acreage, and what can be achieved under the subdivision regulations. Consideration of the total acreage without accounting for infrastructure, road layout, functional lot configuration, or meeting all of the requirements of the subdivision regulations would be an inaccurate representation of development entitlement. Next slide. Subdivisions in TTRM policy areas are required to comply with the rural character subdivision standards, including identification of primary conservation land, so those sensitive areas which are preserved from development, and identif identification of the remaining area, which becomes the development footprint. So the development footprint would represent the area suitable for development and would serve as a basis for comparison in terms of a realistic lot layout that could be achieved under the existing zoning. The plan displayed on this slide represents some of the existing conditions that would qualify as primary conservation land, including steeper slopes, potential wetlands, floodplain, and streams. Problem soils, which is another feature identified as primary conservation land, are also present on this site, but not displayed on this slide. A conceptual development footprint was initially provided to staff, but it did not identify the underlying conservation and rural maintenance policy areas. Identify, identification of the policy areas within the development footprint is necessary to one, determine if the development footprint is located outside of the environmentally sensitive areas identified by the conservation policy, and two, to evaluate the remaining acreage located in the T2RM policy area that may be considered for development. Next slide. This information was not provided by the applicant. However, staff has evaluated and determined that approximately 900 acres are located in the conservation policy area, leaving approximately 219 acres that may be suitable for development. The policy advises that new development in T2RM should be through the use of rural character subdivision at a maximum gross density of one dwelling unit per two acres with individual lots no smaller than the existing zoning. If the 219 acres that staff identified within the T2RM policy were found to be suitable for development, the maximum density would yield slightly under 110 lots. The proposed SP includes 506 lots. While it may be possible to subdivide the portions of the site suitable for development, staff is unable to determine the appropriate development threshold without having a conceptual layout that demonstrates overall impact. 
Next slide. It's also worth noting that a majority of the site is already zoned for lot sizes of approximately two acres, consistent with policy guidance for new development. Approximately 1,105 acres are currently zoned AR2A, which requires a minimum lot size of two acres, or RF80, which requires a minimum lot size of 1.84 acres. The areas, that, the areas within the red boundary are um, zoned RF80, and then the yellow, yellow orange boundary, um, that's the portion that's, that's zoned AR2A. Next slide. The second area of concern is the land use policy. The TTRM policy is applicable to areas that are zoned rural residential, where the primary land use is rural residential, or that are envisioned to remain primarily rural residential. Proposed lots or proposed uses include 506 single family residential lots, but the plan also identifies other uses, including agricultural activity, religious institution, and rural bed and breakfast homestay as permitted uses. Many of the other uses proposed are not currently permitted or are only permitted by special exception. The plan does not specify the size or scope of these additional permitted uses or identify particular areas of the site where they are proposed. Based on the limited information provided, staff is unable to make a determine on the, determination on the collective impact of the proposed uses and whether these uses are consistent with the land use policy. Next slide. Our third area of concern is the sewer policy. Areas designated as T2 rural or as conservation within a T2 rural context in National Next are intended to remain rural in character until the Planning Commission acts to change their designation. Rural character is defined in National Next and relies on low density of development that may be incompatible with the availability of sanitary sewer connections. As explained earlier in my presentation and in your, your staff report, existing sewer service is not available and a public sewer extension will be required to connect to the site. To maintain rural character and to be consistent with the T2RM policy guidance of National Next, it is the policy of the Planning Commission to recommend disapproval of any extension of sewer services to areas designated as T2 rural or as conservation within a T2 rural context, as well as any expansion of current sewer service beyond what is necessary to adequately serve current customers. Unless the Director of Metro Water Services has determined that there is a health and safety issue uh, that requires the extension and expansion. You all should have received a copy of the sewer policy with these details. Property owners wishing uh, in these rural areas wishing to develop their property more intensely than these policies allow should submit a request to change the relevant area to a non-rural policy within National Next. A land use policy change was not requested with this application. Staff evaluation indicates the proposed development will be more intense than what the land use policies allow, but our analysis is based on assumptions because limited information was provided by the applicant. Therefore, staff is unable to make a final determination on development intensity and evaluate this request against the sewer extension policy. Next slide. To summarize, um, the site is unique in that it, it is largely undeveloped and contains features that have been preserved over time, including natural ridges and valleys that contribute to the rural character of the surrounding area. While may, it may be possible to develop the site sensitively in a manner that is consistent with policy guidance, staff is unable to determine if the plan complies without having a conceptual layout plan that demonstrates compliance with the adopted subdivision regulations. Any specific plan that proposes the creation of individual lots must also demonstrate uh, compliance with the applicable subdivision regulations and the stormwater management ordinance. Approval of an SD does not relieve a property owner of these requirements. One of staff's primary concerns is the ability of the plan to meet basic life safety requirements relative to proposed access and circulation, given the environmental features that may impact road connectivity internal to the site. Until this information has been provided, staff is unable to review the appropriateness of this request relative to the sewer extension policy. Additionally, the SD includes a variety of other uses that are permitted beyond the proposed 506 single family lots. While additional information was requested regarding the scope and scale of those uses, it has not been received. Therefore, projections of traffic counts are premature and cannot be provided accurately. And finally, not all agencies have recommended approval. Next slide.
Given the totality of staff concerns and that not all agencies have provided recommendations of approval, staff recommends disapproval. Thank you, Sean. Appreciate that presentation. Now we are uh, ready for this item. Uh, we for we'll open the public hearing on this particular item. And Sean, do we have the applicant on the line? Chairman, we do have representatives of the applicant, and they are unmuted and uh, able to speak. Okay, perfect. And I want to welcome uh, the you guys uh, on this particular item. Uh, you'll have 10 minutes to speak. You can save two of the 10 minutes for rebuttal if you so choose. And so please state your name and address and you may begin. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, this is uh, Alan Thompson with Reagan Smith and Associates. Uh, I'm the uh, land development consultant for the project. Uh, Brandon Baxter is also on the line. He is the transportation engineer. Uh, appreciate uh, the, the ability to speak for the commissioners. Uh, as, as well as Council Lady Murphy. Um, we're here on behalf of our client, South Harpeth LLC Properties and Metropolitan Equity LP. Um, it looks as though the uh, presentation is up, so if you could go to the next slide. I just made introductions. If you go to the next slide, please. Um, first of all, I want to say we have worked with staff. Uh, we we completely respect their position on this and understand that position. Uh, they have been good to work with. Uh, we respectfully uh, disagree uh, with their, their end uh, results. Uh, that being said, uh, we have worked on this project for you know almost two years now. Uh, the applicant understands that this is a very special property. Uh, they have purchased this over 22 years ago. Uh, as you can see, uh, this kind of gives you a general location. Uh, at the intersection of McCory and Highway 100 is the Loveless Cafe to give people a little bit more uh, idea of where this lands. Uh, again, 1,119 acres. Uh, you see a lot of canopied area. You can see slope and terrain in that area. You can see a lake in that area. Uh, there are also valleys and there are ridge tops and there are plateaus. Uh, next slide, please. This is the lake that we spoke of, so it's very unique, and there's great beauty that drew our client here in the first place. Next slide. Uh, as well as streams that we have to be aware of and protect. Next slide. Drainage ways as well. Next slide. Ridge tops uh, that have flat plateaus. Next slide. In larger plateau areas, uh, in particular areas on site. Next slide. In addition to that, beautiful valleys uh, that, that are uh, definitely situated appropriately to, to engage a community. Next slide. All right, that said, um, we looked at this this property uh, with the direction that preservation of this site was of the utmost importance. Next slide. Uh, so we had uh, a hydrological assessment to look at the natural resources, understand there's several streams, uh, wet weather conveyances, um, and intermittent streams. Next slide. Also, as Abby mentioned, uh, a lot of slope and terrain on this property as indicated here. Uh, this is showing uh, 15 to greater to 20% and greater slopes. Next slide. The zoning history, I want to touch base on that uh, quickly. Uh, when our applicants came in uh, 22 years ago, uh, go to the next slide, please. This is actually a PUD, and you can see roughly two acre lots across that. That does not complete the whole property, but the majority of it. Next slide. This is back in 1988 of May 24th. Next slide. 
and that's that's kind of what they were looking at at the time our client did not feel that this was appropriate uh, for this site uh, and felt that there's a better way to do it next slide so this is where we're zoned as Appy had mentioned before um, roughly uh, one per two acre uh, density uh, level however uh, there was an implementation with natural next that came in 2011 that that altered that next slide so um, again we felt this regulatory sp uh, with the intention to preserve protect the natural resources and responsibly integrate a community into the site was our charge next slide So we felt like a set of guidelines would be the appropriate approach. Next slide. And you can flip through the next couple of slides. So the approach was to look at smaller lots that would come in this developable footprint. The same amount of area would be preserved in terms of your natural resource and your uh, open space areas. Uh, so we, we plan on and agree uh, to adhere to the to the rural preservation subdivision preserv uh, regulations uh, as they are uh, once we come in with final SP. Next slide. Uh, we look at different unique uh, approaches from a, a roadway section. Next slide. Especially on the ridge top to minimize impact. Next slide. And you can go through the next few slides. This is the intent of what we'd like to do, minimizing impact of the canopy and the area as well. So just flip through this, please. Uh, community safety is a big thing. Next slide. As uh, Councilman Rosenberg had mentioned, we look at two acre site that would be dedicated for fire. We're approximately six miles away from station 37. And again, Davidson County goes an additional six miles to the west. Next slide. A lot of improvements have to be made uh, to the roadway system. Uh, go to the next slide. Next slide, please. The most significant improvement will be our main entrance on the Highway 100, uh, where we will be eliminating bad access points from Old Harding Pike that lead to the Trinity Monastery School reconnecting that entrance to line up with our entrance, adding the appropriate uh, detail lanes and left turn lanes. Uh, we'd also be looking at a proposed easement to our neighbor, uh, to our, our west there, I'm sorry, our east there. They currently have a driveway that, that provides significant safety issues. You can flip through the next through uh, the next intersections. So next slide. This would be improvements at Lewis Road and Macquarie. Next slide. Macquarie and 100. Next slide. South Harpeth and 100. So significant improvements will be made in order to accommodate uh, the impact that this would have uh, on the existing roadway system. But these are improvements that will clear up and fix existing safety issues up and down Highway 100. With that, uh, I would appreciate y'all's consideration and Brandon and myself will be available for any questions you have. Thank you. Thank you. And Sean, how much time is left? Chair, they have two minutes and 16 seconds remaining, so we'll reserve two minutes for rebuttal. Thank you. And so now we are ready. This is the time when we are ready to take calls from the public only on item number 21, which is uh, the item that we are on right now. Um, so please call in. Uh, members of the public who wish to call in, your screens should show the call in number now. Um, you don't need to wait until uh, others to call in because you'll be placed in a queue on this particular item. As a reminder, only call in on the current case. When you begin your testimony, uh, please state your name and address and whether you are uh, in favor or oppose um, and and the, whether you are in favor or, uh, or oppose the item. Uh, we're not able to display a timer visibly, so Sean will be keeping track of your time. You have two minutes to speak. 
Um, she will give you a 30 second warning and then we'll tell you when your time is up. And so we appreciate everybody calling it. Um, now, uh, we, while we wait for callers to get in the queue on this particular item, uh, we need to check in on with Lisa on emails. Lisa, do we receive any emails on this item? Hi, Chairman. Yes, we received, um, let's see, 11 emails in opposition and two emails in support. Okay, thank you. Appreciate that. And I want to thank everybody for writing in. Sean, do we have any callers now on this item? Chair, we do have callers in the queue, so we'll get the first one um, lined up here, and I'll let you know when we place them in. Thanks, John. Chair, we're just working with the caller to get their live stream muted. Thank you. And you have the caller in the meeting now, Chair. Thank you. Welcome. We want to welcome you to our call. You have two minutes. Please state your name and address, and you may begin. Good evening, members of the commission. Mr. Chairman, my name is Douglas Berry. I'm an attorney in Nashville here with the law firm of Miller & Martin, and I represent Mr. Chuck Elkin. Uh, Mr. Elkin is a landowner who lives right across the South Harpeth Road from the proposed project, and he has turned in a, a comment uh, for the August 20 meeting, and just to summarize the points he made was that how, how dangerous uh, South Harpeth Road already was, and that adding additional 500 additional homes to that uh, road would be extremely dangerous, that the uh, proposed project would uh, be detrimental to the rural nature and character of the neighborhood, that there was potential environmental impact with the runoff South Park River, and finally that the project was not compatible with surrounding land uses of the Metro uh, land use plan and the local area plan. Uh, I want to say also we reviewed the excellent staff report and uh, its analysis and conclusions and agree with that staff report and would uh, adopt it as, as, as our position. Uh, my home address is 30, 3826 Whitland Avenue, Nashville 37205. But that's um, and as I said, the staff report, we, we urge the planning commission to disapprove this uh, rezoning. Uh, it also appears to me that, that, that in many instances, the information provided by the, by the owner's uh, team, whom I know and respect and worked with many, years, many times over the years, that it really was facially insufficient for the staff to even make the recommendations. Caller, you have 30 seconds. Uh, so that, that concludes our remarks, and uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to comment. Thank you. Appreciate you calling it. Sure. Our next caller. Chairman, you have the next caller. Okay, welcome. Please state your name and address, and you may begin. Hi, my name is Douglas Painter. I live at 8495 Poplar Creek Road, very close to the uh, proposed project. And I'm calling in case number 2020 SP 034001. And I'm calling in opposition to the uh, proposed project. First, I'd like to thank uh, Planning Commission colleague Abby Rickoff for all of her work that she's done on this. Obviously, she's done a lot of work on this particular matter. And I'd like to thank her for initial disapproval recommendation. Frankly, I think all one needs to do is drive the roads boundary in this area. And you will easily see why this project should not be approved. The roads simply are in no shape or condition to handle this sort of project. Frankly, I'm surprised my councilman, Dave Rosenberg, is reporting this. Given the current zoning and the National Next Guidelines, and given Mr. Rosenberg's past conservative zoning record, I'm truly surprised. However, when you dig deeper and you look into his campaign donations, and you see the donations by the developer, Freeman Webb and Bill Freeman, and Reagan Smith and employees of Reagan Smith you can understand why he's in support of this particular project. I think those campaign donations soil a problem. Sir, sir, excuse me, but please keep it on the zoning issue. I am. They project okay. pro quo. Those donations do project a quid pro quo. 
I believe, and it's no longer an arm's length transaction. I myself, I do, I, I'm involved in real estate uh, deals in the private sector, and this is not an arm's length transaction. The best example Caller, you have 30 seconds. is for me to hire an appraiser that I give money to. I couldn't do that. I'm not even allowed to talk to an appraiser. And so, at the very least, those campaign donations uh, demand a... Sir, we need to keep it on the zoning, not sure. on the illegal activity. You need to address that somewhere else. The traffic study should be done by an independent... Uh, and uh, not not somebody that's a campaign donating uh, to Dave Rosenberg or Reagan Smith uh, that, that soils the deal. Caller, your time has expired. Please finish your thought. I'm done. Thank you. Dave's opening comments were... Next caller, please. ...commercial development of this particular project. There you, thank you for calling in. Next caller, Sean. Chairman, we don't have any other callers in the queue at the moment, so we will take a brief pause here in case anyone is trying to reach us, and then I'll check back in with you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Any other callers, Sean? Chair, we have no other callers in the queue. Okay, thank you. And so we are now ready for a rebuttal. An applicant, you have two minutes. Chair, we're working on unmuting them, so just bear with us a second. Thank you. They should All be right, able uh, to speak. All right, perfect. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I appreciate that and I appreciate the comments. Um, first of all, addressing 506 homes on South Harpeth Road. Uh, this would be a, what we call a, a secondary access. Our main access is on Highway 100. Uh, we certainly would see the majority of the project uh, going through that access point and the minority of the property using the access point to the far west. So. So it won't be the entire development going through South Harpeth Road. Uh, I do agree South Harpeth Road will need to be upgraded to a degree that will be assessed before we go to a final SP. And we will have to meet safety standards as deemed by Metro Public Works or we will not be approved. Uh, same with environmental issues. Uh, we That's the reason we have looked at this site as long as we have. We did a hydrological assessment. Uh, so that we would know these sensitive areas that we would have to buffer and we do it responsibly. Uh, no uh, additional uh, pollution and or uh, additional stormwater will come off our site. That will also be regulated by Metro Public Works, uh, no greater than what is seen today. Um, in regards to not being in character with the surrounding areas, uh, I do not feel this is a, a, an appropriate uh, issue with the property because no houses within this property will be seen from outside this property. So it really is uh, not significant in regards to how it addresses uh, the surrounding areas. Um, again, we were uh, put in place to make sure that we preserve this site and we address it very Applicant, you have 30 seconds. Thank you to engage, to engage a community in this property very sensitively and respect those natural resources uh, in the highest manner. Um, in regards to in, insufficient uh, information, uh, we did talk earlier with staff in regards to the land use uh, plan and that felt that an amendment uh, would not be supported regardless of that request, that request was not made. This is also a regulatory SP and limited information uh, is, is more appropriate for a regulatory SP. It's Advocate more guidelines. Your time is up. Please finish your thought. Thank you. Yeah, a regulatory SP is more guidelines as opposed to a direct plan. Uh, with that, again, I appreciate uh, staff's comments, appreciate uh, Planning Commission's consideration. 
Thank you. And uh, I do know the councilman's on the line, and so we'll um, we'll make sure we call on on him. And I, um, but before we call on the council member, I do want to remind the callers that call in to please. We have always kept uh, the this meeting professional, and so I ask that you extend the professionalism uh, to the planning commission as well. And the focus should be on the zoning issue and the, and the material zoning part of, of the project. Um, comments shouldn't focus on the person uh, or their character involved in the case or a council member. So I want to be crystal clear, please keep your comments professional or we'll cut, cut it off. So um, I appreciate uh, everybody for doing that. So councilman, I think you're on the line. Yep, Councilman, you recognize. Uh, thank you, Mr. I don't really have anything to add. I appreciate uh, Abby's work on this and all the thought she's put into it, uh, the work that the applicant has done and those who have emailed in, and I look forward to hearing y'all's uh, discussion on the matter. Thank you. Excellent, thank you, Councilman, appreciate it. All right, so um, seeing no one else wishing to speak, we'll close, this pub we'll close the public hearing. And how about we start off with Commissioner Blackshear? Sure. Um, well, this is certainly a beautiful piece of property, so I can understand why um, the developer would want to develop it. And I can also understand why neighbors would uh, oppose the development of it. Um, as I was going through staff's analysis and then listening, of course, to staff's analysis again, um, it did, although there is a recommendation of disapproval, it doesn't really seem that staff is necessarily affirmatively disapproving the plan. Um, staff is just saying that it does not have enough information in order to approve the plan. Um, and it looks like from the developer's comments and also the letter that was sent, which was um, really helpful, honestly, um, the developer acknowledges that they're still information um, to be given, but presumably because this is a regulatory SP does not feel that um, it is required to maybe turn over that information to um, staff. Um, I will say it's not often that staff says that it doesn't have enough information to approve a plan. Um, when we generally see disapprovals, it's because of the information presented and it just doesn't comply with policy. Here, staff's, I think, being really um, gracious and saying all of this stuff could potentially work despite the many comments that we've heard from the neighbors, um, but it just doesn't have enough information to approve it. Um, I would love as a commissioner to see more robust information when approving it. I mean, it's hard to say that um, it's hard to hear staff say that it doesn't have enough information to approve a plan and then say, <clears throat> but I have enough information to approve it. Um, I, I, I hear what the developer is saying, the applicant is saying regarding this being a regulatory SP, but I'm not sure why that would um, necessarily preclude it from giving information that um, one staff could find helpful in um, reviewing the plan, but also that the commission can use in um, in uh, considering this plan. So I'm definitely interested to hear what other commissioners would say, but I mean, I'm, I'm always in favor of more information than less. And um, if, it's, um, if it's not sufficient at this point to consider it, I would be more than in favor of having more information before we, um, as a commission, make a decision on it. Thank you, Commissioner. Vice Chair Farr. I was trying to think about alphabetical order again. Um, so um, I agree with much of what Commissioner Blackshear just said. Um, you know, we have so many debates these days about developing large tracts of our remaining rural land in, in the Nashville area. Um, and some of them we've had to approve, <laughs> um, even though many of us didn't didn't feel great about um, the plan because they fit the they fit the requirements. And this is a case where we really have a chance to um, make sure this is done right in advance. Um, 
And I think the fact that staff doesn't have sufficient information to um, really evaluate this proposal is, is certainly a concern. And, and as Commissioner Blackshear just said, if staff doesn't feel like they have sufficient information, it's hard for me to feel like I have sufficient information. Um, but I also just feel very, very strongly that we need to do everything we can to preserve um, our large remaining open space and, and to develop it responsibly. Um, and uh, I would I would much prefer to wait to see a, a better um, concept plan um, and make sure that this is a the best use for the property. So um, I I will support staff's recommendation. Thank you, Commissioner Gobble. Uh, I agree with the staff's recommendation. I think the um, I, I don't see how you can get 500 houses in there. Not saying you can't, but I would that would need to be proved proven um, and respect the property as they say they want to. I do think they've got an excellent team together. I do think that the potential for developing the property is certainly there in a very responsible way. And the aspirational images that we saw does show what a unique piece of property it is. But I do agree that with staff's recommendation at this point. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Haynes. No additional comments from uh, the prior three commissioners, and I agree with staff's recommendation. Commissioner Johnson. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, I too agree with uh, all previous uh, commissioners' comment. And you know, I do appreciate uh, applicant effort and intent to you know preserve and protect natural resource and so that's a great thing and their imagination to have uh you know future uh dedication for the fire station all this good thought i do appreciate it however uh you know uh same as staff if staff cannot uh you know properly uh imagine and participate where those 506 homes will go i as a commissioner i cannot imagine and way on uh, so since this is a regulatory sp in such a large a uh, lot I, I i too would like to see more detailed plan and how and where they intend to develop and how and where they intend to preserve so as of right now uh, unfortunately not enough information uh, so i do agree with a staff recommendation recommendation as well thank you commissioner lawson Commissioner Lawson, you're still uh, on mute, Commissioner Lawson. There you go. Uh, thank you. Somebody likes me down there, don't they? Uh, you know, I think the staff has done an outstanding job in, in bringing to the forefront the things that we want them to in evaluating this proposal. On the same token, I'm a little bit concerned that there may be an opportunity to refine the application that will meet the criteria, can answer a lot of questions that we still have as a commission. And I'm not going to re reiterate everything that other commissioners have said because they're very good comments. Uh, my whole thing is I wish that we could consider looking at perhaps an indefinite deferral, giving the staff an opportunity to go back to the applicant and say, we need more information before we can pass on this. And if this is not accomplished, then put it under a, uh, on a new agenda as an I, as a item that is uh, recommended for disapproval. Thank you, sir. Council A. Murphy. Thank you, chair. Um, I guess a process question for the staff. If I, as I'm wearing my commission hat tonight and wearing my uh, council hat next week, so if this is disapproved tonight and taken to the council, I know that the council would have to pass it with 27 votes. Um, if that were to happen, uh, then they would have to come back with the final SP to just the commission. Is that correct? or is that just to staff? Hi, this uh, is Lisa. 
Generally, um, final site plans are generally um, administrative so long as they meet um, the requirements or are consistent with the preliminary. Okay. What if the um, what if that final SP comes back and it meets the requirements of the S the regulatory SP, but it doesn't meet the sub the subdivision sub regulations subdivision regulations. I'm sorry of of this area. So that's that is one of the things that is a little bit more complicated with um, a project like this, um, because it is an SP, but it is also within the rural policy. Um, if they are intending to subdivide, which which all indications are that they are, then the subdivision then we'll also have to have a subdivision plat that meets the rural regulations. Um, and so we would need to see a um, along with the final site plan, we would really need to see a subdivision concept plan that we would review against the rural subregs. So an SP doesn't get you out of meeting those rural subregs. And so if we got, um, you know, a concept plan that didn't meet the subdivision regulations, um, then we couldn't necessarily approve it, um, even if it met sort of the intent of this rural SP because the, or the, I'm sorry, this regulatory SP. And so we still have to meet the subdivision regulations as well. Okay. Um, and the, the part about the two acres for the fire hall, has that been accepted by the fire marshal or is that the department that is still out um, that hasn't made a recommendation either way? Um, fire has is still marked as returned. Um, there are some outstanding issues that need to be addressed. Um, so that that's where they are right now. They they still have not approved um, the plan. Okay, and then last question: As what has been interesting that I've noticed on the commission here is that typically when there are large uh, tracts of land like this, um, I guess. Traditionally, I've seen them as as the old school puds um, come through. Is that because it are is it because it's such a big lot or such a big so many parcels put together that it's traditionally not used done as a regulatory SP? Or I, I guess I've seen like other the usually in South Nashville we see like phase one, phase two, phase three. Was that discussed with the applicant doing this in phases rather than uh, all at once? So we don't typically, hi, this is Lisa. Um, we don't get a whole lot of new PUDs under review. I mean, a lot of the old PUDs um, that currently exist, we might see those come in to be phased under development, um, but we're sort of reacting to PUDs that have been in place since like the 70s or the 80s, but we don't really see a whole lot of new applications for PUDs. Um, we sort of moved away from those at a time and into SPs. Um, this was the application as it was received, um, and so that is is, um, is what staff are reviewed and evaluated. Okay, thank you. I'll listen to um, everyone else's comments. Thank you, and Commissioner Sims. Yes, sir. Uh, first of all, I'm, I'm intrigued with this whole piece of property and how it could be developed. Um, but when I read Ms. Rickoff's analysis, I decided this could be an exemplar for policy school. It was so well written. Um, so I'm always prone when something is this well written to approve whatever the staff requests. Um, but I want to add one thing quickly, and that is since October of 2005, when SPs were first discussed by our Metro Council, it really gave two um, supporting guidelines, and that was that SPs were intended to give developers more certainty and neighborhood, I mean, more flexibility and neighborhoods more certainty. I think this one is actually giving the developers more flexibility, but in the 14 comments we received, both verbally and in writing, there is a lot of comments about not knowing really what's going on here. So I think that's just one more reason to disapprove this. Thank you, and uh, is Commissioner Tibbs still on the line? I'm here. All right, Commissioner Tibbs. Um, I agree with the uh, analysis or the, the comments of everybody, uh, specifically Commissioner Blackshear and, and Vice Chair 
uh, far uh, that got into more of the specifics. But uh, in general, it kind of leads to just needing more information. Um, there are some, um, you know, some general things that I think um, Ms. Rickoff brought up that are very specific on why um, staff may the recommendation with disapproval, and I, I agree with it. So um, with that, I'd like to make a motion to accept staff recommendation for disapproval. That's a proper motion. Is there a second? If you would raise your hand in the icon to your icon hand. And Commissioner Johnson, would you like to second? Like yes, I second the motion. Okay, that's a proper second. Any other discussion? If you would raise your hand or verbally state you would like to discuss anything else? Seeing no other discussion from the commissioners, we're ready for a roll call vote to disapprove. Commissioner Blackshear. Aye. Vice Chair Farr. Aye. Commissioner Gobble. Aye. Commissioner Haynes. Aye. Commissioner Johnson. Aye. Commissioner Lawson. Commissioner, Commissioner Lawson? No. Commissioner Sims. Aye. Commissioner Tibbs. Aye. Councilor A. Murphy. No. All right. That would be eight ayes and two noes. And the motion to disapprove passes. We are now on to item 22. So let's see. Who the item number 22. Okay, next slide, please. Thank you, John. Okay, this is a request to create six lots along Row Rig Court. It's off, it's off Jones Circle. Next slide. And the staff recommend approval with conditions. Next slide. This side is, it's positioned off Row Rig Court. It's off Jones Circle. It's in Old Hickory. And it's bordered by the Cumberland. The site zoned R15. It's surrounded by R15 zoning as well. The land use that's surrounding it is one and two family residential. Next slide, please. So the land use policy um, helps to set the stage when reviewing subdivisions. Um, however, the role of the policy in reviewing subdivisions, is, it's limited to providing guidance on which section of the subdivisions that the application should be reviewed against. And so the language in the land use policy is not used to determine appropriateness of subdivisions, but it points to the chapter. Next slide, please. And for this subdivision, chapter three was used and it was used in compatibility. Um, the subdivision meets the minimum standards of RS10 zoning district and the proposed lots have all have frontage on either an existing or newly proposed public street. Also, all reviewing agencies have recommended approval. Next slide. So when we run the analysis for the compatibility standards, of chapter three of the subdivisions. Uh, this site yields a minimum lot size of 23,958 square feet. All of the proposed lots are at least that. They range from 23,961 square feet to 38,977 square feet. The required minimum lot frontage is 39 feet. All the proposed lots are uh, at least that. They're all 50 feet in frontage and the required um, front setbacks, we used context, contextual setbacks. So for lots one, two, and three, all of those are required to be 50 feet and lots four, five, and six are 100 and all lots are meeting those contextual required setbacks. Um, and all of the lots have um, the required orientation on the public street. And next slide, please. So uh, the proposed subdivision that we see here meets all the standards of the subdivision regulations. Um, any future development will be required to meet the standards of the Metro code in regards to setbacks and sidewalks. 
and staff recommend approval with conditions as the proposed subdivision meets all the requirements of the subdivision regulations. Thank you. Thank you, and uh, I believe, Lisa, remind me if this is the, we, we, we've already held the um, public hearing on this one, didn't we? Is this the one? Uh, no, Chairman, we have not. The public hearing is open. Uh, okay, I thought the councilman, that's okay, I got you. Excellent. I uh, wanted to make sure, thank you for your clarification. And so on this item, we will, open the public hearing um, and as we open the public hearing, uh, Sean is the applicant on the line. Chair, we do have the applicant and they are unmuted and can speak when recognized. All right, uh, welcome. You have 10 minutes. You can save two of the 10 minutes for rebuttal and please state your name and address. Welcome. Thank you, just checking audio. Can you hear me? I hear you, go ahead. All right, great. This is Adam Sager at Dale and Associates, uh, 516 Heather Place, Nashville, 37204. Uh, appreciate everybody's time. This property, as you can see, is uh, a parcel or kind of a leftover property that wasn't uh, fully planned out uh, when the other lots on Roaring Court were, were developed. And so the client is coming back now and they're establishing these six lots that you see before you. Uh, it's, it's a pretty straightforward subdivision. Um, we just uh, are abiding by the subdivision regulations, the zoning ordinances, and uh, put it together, as you can see through, through Joran's report there. Um, if, you're, if you're wondering why we're on public hearing, uh, the, this project was on consent agenda at last planning commission meeting and I believe there were neighbors that uh, called in or, or emailed, and so it got deferred to this meeting. And since that time, my client has reached out to the neighbors, and it's our understanding that uh, their, their question or concern was that they wanted to make Roaring Court a private road. Uh, they're a neighbor that was already living on Roaring Court. And we explained to him, well, this final plat process is not the mechanism with which to address a private versus public road and much less a, a public road that's already existing. And so he understood that. Um, and I believe we have addressed any concerns and they understand the process. Um, so it got put back on to, uh, tonight's agenda and it's before you, I think it stays on to be heard. And so that's why we're, we're presenting to you here now but I think we've addressed that. I don't know if there's gonna be any callers after me. Um, if so, I'm gonna you know, reserve my time, but just wanted to offer that explanation on why it was pulled off consent last time. Um, I, I can't think of really anything else to, to say on this. It's a pretty straightforward subdivision. We're meeting the subdivision regulations and we agree with, with staff's comments. And so with that, I'll uh, reserve my time for any rebuttal. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much. And uh, you'll have two minutes for rebuttal. So uh, we are now ready to take calls from the members of the public who wish to call in. Your screen should show the call-in number. Please, as a reminder, only call in on this particular item, item number 22. Um, you don't need to wait to call in on this item because when you call, we'll put you in a queue. Um, and so you will be heard, uh, you'll be put in the queue in the order that you call in. When you begin your testimony, please state your name, address, and whether you support or oppose the project. We're not able to display a timer visibly, but as a reminder, Sean will um, be keeping track of time and, and we'll let you know when, 30, uh, when you have 30 seconds left, and then she'll also let you know when your time is up. And so while we wait for folks uh, to to call in, uh, let's ask Lisa for, uh, have we received any uh, emails on this item, Lisa? Hi, Chairman. We did not receive emails. We received a phone call um, indicating that someone wanted the item pulled, uh, which is why it was pulled, but we didn't receive any additional correspondence. Okay, thank you, Lisa. Appreciate that. Sean, do we have any callers in the queue yet? 
Chair, we don't have any callers in the queue yet, so we'll take a brief pause in case anyone's trying to reach us, and then I'll check back in. Thank you. Appreciate that. Chair, we do not have any callers for this item. Thank you, and I believe that uh, the councilman already spoke on this, and he is not on the line, Mr. Hager. So um, I'll ask the applicant. Uh, the, there was no one that called in, so I'm, a, I'm assuming you don't want to do a rebuttal? Uh, no, nothing to rebut. I'm here if you uh, have any questions. Thank you. All right, thank you. Seeing no one else wishing to speak, I declare this public hearing closed and we will, how about we try, I always like to try, I, I wanna make sure every commissioner gets a chance to speak, but sometimes when we don't have any um, uh, people calling in, it seems to be resolved. Uh, let's try, instead of calling on every commissioner, if let's try to um, see if there's any discussion amongst the commissioners, if you'll raise your hand and then I know we're supposed to get a motion beforehand, but let's try to see if you'll raise your hand or verbally want to say anything on this item. Seeing none, let's get a motion. Vice Chair Farr, you want to make a motion? Um, I will make a motion that we accept staff's recommendation um, of approval. Thank you, Vice Chair. And, and is there a second? Uh, Commissioner Sims, would you like to second? I second it. That's a proper motion and second. Any discussion, please raise your hand if you would like to discuss or verbally state that you would like to discuss. Seeing no other discussion, we are ready for a roll call vote to approve. Commissioner Blackshear. Aye. Vice Chair Farr. Commissioner Gobble. Aye. Commissioner Haynes. Aye. Commissioner Johnson. Aye. Commissioner Lawson. Aye. Council Lady Murphy. Aye. Commissioner Sims. Aye. Commissioner Tibbs. Aye. Ayes have it, 10 to zero. And this item, item 22 is approved. We are now, so before we go on to the next item, I know we've been here about an hour and 45 minutes almost. Um, director or vice chair, should we take a quick five minute break? And because I know the next item is probably going to be, there's a lot of interest. So there might, it might be long. Uh, vice chair, what do you think? Um, I'm okay with going forward, but I would. You are? Sure. Yep. Okay. Yeah. I just want to check, you know, I, I always uh, like to check uh, with the commissioners, uh, you know, and make sure we're all okay. Director, are you okay with moving forward? I am. Thank you for checking. Okay. Hey, Chairman, do you want to just ask if any of the commissioners would like a short break? If they raise their hand, just give yeah. them a chance. Let's do that. Yes. Yeah, see, you're, that's why we pay you the big money. <laughs> Uh, commissioners, if you would raise your hand or state that you want to have a break. I know this is kind of weird, but I don't see. I think everybody wants to move forward, Vice Chair. Sounds great. See, I'm too nice. I'm being too nice. Last time, I, w I think I went seven hours, no break, no notice. Seven hours was too long. <laughs> Two hours is okay. <laughs> I apologize for that, commissioners. I, I, I was just trying to uh, get finished. I, I do apologize. Uh, all right, so we are now on to item number 23. And we're ready to hear it. Can you hear me, Mr. Chair? Uh, yes, you recognize. Wonderful. Good afternoon, commissioners. My name is Eric Hammer. The next item on the agenda is item 23, a requested modification to the standards of the downtown code. Next. The request is for a modification to the overall height standard of the downtown code. Next. 
planning staff's recommendation is to approve with conditions and disapprove without all conditions. Next. The current zoning is downtown code core historic subdistrict. Please note the property is the only property on the block base bounded by Union Street to the north and Bankers Alley to the south that is within this subdistrict. Next. The policy is T6 downtown core. Next. The overall height modification is the process that replaced the special exception and variance process for overall building height in the downtown area. It was instituted via text amendment as approved by council on August 4th, 2015 with council bill 2015-1053. Next. The process for the overall height modification is outlined in the downtown code. The process requires that the plan make a determination as to whether reasonable efforts have been made to use all available bonus high program bonuses. This determination has been issued. The applicant is also required to hold a community meeting with notices sent to property owners within 300 feet. Planning additionally has discussed the project with additional non-governmental neighborhood stakeholders, including the Downtown Partnership and Historic National Link. The applicant has held a meeting on July 9th and several questions were fielded about the plans with several attendees. In addition to the requirements outlined in the flowchart in front of you, the applicant went through the design review process through the design review committee, which is administered by MDHA for a recommendation on the height modification, as well as a review of the modifications to the tower dimension standard of the downtown code. This design review committee includes experts in architecture, neighborhood representatives, and other design professionals. The committee discussed aspects of the plan in detail, including the proposed height, materiality of the addition, activation of alley number three, the appropriateness of the height relative to other buildings on the same block, and the interior restoration. The committee convened on August 18th and voted in favor with two opposed to recommend approval of 17 stories and conceptually approve the design. Next, please. As part of the process for the overall height modification, the downtown code states the planning commission shall review and may grant additional height for exceptional design, including but not limited to unique architecture, exceptionally strong streetscapes, and improvement of the property's relationship to surrounding properties. Next. The project proposes a 17-story hotel, with 13 stories being a vertical addition on top of an existing three-story building. Also included is a ground floor restaurant and lobby space. No on-site parking is provided. None is required within the downtown code. In addition to reopening the lobby entrance to 3rd Avenue North, pedestrian openings to alley number three are proposed to activate this space. The existing three-story building was originally constructed for use as a Federal Reserve Bank, but has been significantly modified from that original use to function as a large single-family residence. Next. These are the views of the north and west elevations. The materials of the addition are fiber cement panels and glazing. They contrast the existing building in style and materiality. Encouraging differentiation between an existing building and an addition is a common best practice when working with historic properties. The north abuts alley number three, on the other side of which is the Stallman building. West facade addresses Third Avenue directly. Next, please. These are the south and west elevations, east, excuse me. Both face interior property lines, but will likely remain visible for the lifetime of the building due to restrictions on adjacent properties. Next. Although the subject property was placed on the National Register in 1984, it is neither within a historic preservation zoning overlay nor a historic landmark district. In front of you is a map of the downtown core. Uh, actually, presenter, can you move back a slide? Uh, can you move forward a slide? Okay, these are out of order. I'm sorry about that. Um, I'll pick up where I left off. In front of you is a map of the downtown core and surrounding areas with properties within one of these overlays noted. 
In yellow are the historic landmark overlays. In red, the historic preservation overlays. The Broadway, Second Avenue, and downtown historic preservation overlays are the three historic preservation overlays in downtown proper. Can we go back one? Thank you. Please note the location of the site in relation to the Second Avenue historic preservation overlay. There are no zoning controls on this particular property that would prevent alteration or demolition of the existing building. The site is currently zoned for six stories and may earn or transfer an additional four stories for a total of 10 stories. Forward two, thank you. Overall height modifications may be granted for exceptional design, which is reviewed by three broad criteria, including but not limited to unique architecture, exceptionally strong streetscapes, and improvements of the project relationship with surrounding properties. The building has been significantly modified since it was used as a Federal Reserve Bank and has functioned as a large single family home for several decades and accessible to the general public. Alterations like the addition of a floor that halves the grand lobby and a general lack of maintenance pose challenges for an adaptive reuse. Also challenging is the need to accommodate the basic life safety equipment required by modern building codes within the existing structure. Next. The proposed design activates the adjacent segment of alley number three with an active entrance and outdoor dining, providing an enhanced pedestrian streetscape with a living alley concept. The plan also calls for the restoration of the grand lobby with necessary support structures, elevators, and stairs included. Next. The design of the vertical addition is distinct from the existing building below it, in both materiality and configuration. This distinction is a key design feature that maintains the integrity of the existing building. Next. The addition is generally compatible at the street level with the Stallman building, which is 12 stories and 180 feet tall, and the American Trust building, or Hotel Indigo it's, as it's now called, which is 15 stories and 180 feet tall. Next, please. Staff recommends approval with the following additions and deferral without all conditions. First, the overall height modification is tied specifically to the preservation of the existing structure. This approval is conditioned on the applicant's commitment to restore and preserve the exterior and interior of the building, consistent with plans on file and the presentation made to the Planning Commission. Any alterations to the exterior facade or to the interior structure that will result in damage to the historic integrity of the building and that deviate from approved plans must be reconsidered through the design review process, including a determination of appropriate height. Second, the applicant shall pursue an easement or other legal mechanism that preserves the exterior of the existing structure to be recorded prior to use and occupancy. Third, the applicant shall restore the grand lobby and pursue an easement or other legal mechanism that preserves its interior, such that it is no longer partitioned and may not be in the future. The easement or other legal mechanism shall be recorded prior to use and occupancy. And fourth, Public access to the Grand Lobby shall be permitted and shall include a publicly visible display explaining the architectural history of the original structure. This concludes our presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate that. So now is time to open this item for public hearing. And uh, is the, Sean, is the applicant on the line? Chair, we do have representatives for the applicant and they are unmuted and able to speak when recognized. Excellent. And so, uh, Mr. Uh, on the, you're welcome to have your 10 minutes and you can save two minutes of the 10 for rebuttal and please state your name and address and you may begin. Thank you. Great, thank you very much. I'm Patrick Gilbert with Gresham Smith. Can you hear me all right? Yes, we can hear you. Good, good. The address is 222 2nd Avenue South, Nashville 37201. Today um, with me is Daryl Talbert with Icon Entertainment, the property owner. I'm going to present a brief slideshow here and then Daryl will make a couple of comments at the end. Really want to cover three points today. Our pledge to meet the requirements of the downtown code relating to increased height, how this project will not set a precedent for single parcel overall height modifications in the core historic zoning district and our pledge to preserve the existing historic structure. Next slide, please. Our point one 
is um, how are we going to meet the downtown code requirements? There are three requirements related to exceptional design. The first is exceptionally strong streetscape. This is a view on Third Avenue. You can see that the sidewalks are really narrow in front of this building. There's not really much that can be done there, but next slide. We have an alley to the north, it was just talked about. We're, here we're going to focus on making real changes to the streetscape in this alley and plan on activating this alley. Next slide, please. This shows a close-up view with a lot of activity in here in this alley. Also could have room for vehicles if that is necessary. Next slide. There are two additional downtown code requirements for increased height. One's exceptional design, unique architecture and improvement of the project's relationship to surrounding properties. How are we doing this? The original building is really quite handsome and really unique in downtown Nashville. And the vertical addition we're showing is intended to visually contrast with the original building. The result is creating unique architecture on this site and how are we improving the property's relationship to surrounding properties several ways. One is we're activating the alley, as we've discussed. We're creating foot traffic in and out of this building, and we're creating foot traffic that will support surrounding um, retail at street level. Next slide, please. We have a view of the interior of the lobby, which will be returned to its former glory. A later addition of a floor will be removed, which Eric was just telling us about, which allows us to restore the original volume of the lobby. You can see the new stairwell that's required by um, building codes. Next slide, please. This is an additional view of the lobby. It's just going to be an amazing space because all of that ceiling is still in place. One more slide forward, please. This is a view of the building from Third Avenue illustrating unique architecture of both the original building and the addition. Next slide. We have another view of from Third Avenue showing the building in its context. And next slide. This is our point two. How are we not setting precedent for overall height modifications? in the immediate vicinity. First of all, the Federal Reserve parcel is not really contiguous with the rest of the core historic subdistrict, but we are part of that district nonetheless. Our site is one parcel, 48 feet wide, and where historic buildings exist to the south on Third Avenue, the lots range from 20 to 30 feet wide, and based on layout studies that we've developed, it takes about 45 feet of width for a vertical addition to function properly. The balance of the existing historic buildings of the, up to the south really are too narrow for individual additions. Again, we're requesting additional height for a single parcel. In our opinion, this does not set a precedent for someone requesting additional height for multiple or combined parcels. Next slide is a view from Church Street. This shows the proposed health, uh, hotel to the far right in this image. It's a lighter color on purpose to blend with the taller buildings to the north and west. Next slide. This is a view from the East Bank, shows our building to the far right or north. It does not interrupt the continuity of the lower brick skyline of both 2nd and 3rd Avenues from this view. Next slide. There are um, multiple benefits to the community, but we think the primary benefit really is retaining this building and not letting it disappear. Now, next slide. Uh, is our point number three, our pledge to preserve the historic building um, I hope nobody gasped at this slide because this is not what we're going to do. This is showing a gut job of a building. We plan on maintaining and renovating the entire building. And next slide. Final thoughts. Um, keep in mind, one more slide forward, please. Keep in mind that the, since the Federal Reserve moved out of this building in 1958, this building has been underutilized and nominally maintained. What we've just presented we think represents the path for adaptive reuse of this building. The square footage of this building is small, 12,500 square feet, and the dirt or land value is really high. Any adaptive reuse will need a building addition to pay for the renovation of the existing building. And with your approval, we're confident that this building can once again be a jewel in downtown Nashville. And now I'd like to hand over to Daryl Talbert. Thank you, Patrick. Uh, good evening. Chairman and, and Commissioners. I wanted to, to reach out and talk to you a little bit about adaptive reuse. I am Daryl Talbert, Icon Entertainment President and Representative of the Miller family. 
We own several businesses and buildings downtown and are preservationists at our core, and all of our buildings are actually adaptive reuse. As such, we're actually experts in the area of adaptive reuse. For those unfamiliar with that word, it's really pretty simple. You have a building, you have a proposed project, and then you have to find something that every single stakeholder can buy into um, to get to the end and hopefully have consensus. With that said, I worked early on with uh, Tim Walker, director of Metro Historic Commission and, and Robin Ziegler and had them onto the property and just asked them to dream big with what it could be on the inside. I think we've accomplished that. As you can tell, we're, we're struggling over some of the words um, about how to preserve it, but not set precedents. To that degree, let's talk about some of the successes. The building was um, started over 20 stories and, and we've continued to bring that down. And now it's at 1617 and roughly just a shade higher than the Stallman building. We have a complete interior preservation, not really preservation, restoration going on. Um, and we have a way to activate the alley, activate the front access, be ADA compliant, get health safety folks on board. Um, we've tried to give something to every single stakeholder we can to make this viable. And tonight we need your help to preserve this beautiful, beautiful building. And I'm hoping that we don't let perfect Um, I'll turn over our two minutes for rebuttal, and I'm here for questions should you have. Thank you. We appreciate that. And so um, we are, we'll save two minutes uh, for rebuttal. And so we are now at the time of the meeting to uh, take calls from members of the public who wish to call in. Your screen should show the call in number now, so please call in. Um, you don't need to wait uh, until others have spoken because when you call in on this particular item, item number 23, you'll be placed in a queue and that will be the order that we take you. As a reminder, um, when you begin your testimony, please state uh, your name, address, and whether you support or oppose this particular item. We're not able to display the timer visually, um, and so Sean will tell you when you have 30 seconds left uh, and... Um, when your time is up, she will let you know as well. Um, and so while we wait on the callers to get into the queue, Lisa, how many, um, give us the email history. How many emails have we got? Hi, Chairman. We received uh, 10 letters in opposition, eight letters in support. We also received a letter from Council Member O'Connell in support and a letter from the Metro Historic Zoning staff in opposition. Okay, thank you. And uh, I believe that Tim is uh, with the Historical Commission is on the line. And what we'll do is we'll, during the public testimony period, we'll give Tim five minutes as he represents a Metro agency. Um, if he wants to do that. Um, and so now, thank you, Lisa. So Sean, do we, uh, before we, we recognize Tim, let's take all the callers and then we'll recognize Tim last after we, well, after we hear from the public. So Sean, do we have any callers on the item yet? Really? Chair, we do have callers on the line and we are placing the first caller into the meeting now. Okay. Thank I'm you. I'm going to go ahead and place you in the meeting. Thanks. Chairman, you have the first caller. All right, welcome, and you'll have two minutes to speak. Please state your name and address, and you may begin. Uh, Lance Dupree, 508 Davidson Street, 37213. I support the Federal Reserve Building Project approval for many reasons, which I will narrow down to two main reasons. I'm a designer here in Nashville, a downtown resident for the last 15 years. My first reason is based on my current history of firsthand watching the investments of Icon Entertainment in downtown Nashville in the metro area. Each project I have taken on has been completed with respect to the amazing heritage of Nashville and the quality of work that will take Nashville forward with this building for the next 100 years of its life. I have personally witnessed not only the quality but the class that keeps national brand on the world stage in icon's work. My second reason is more personal. I have paid close attention to all the visions of Nashville, 
And now during 2020, all the challenges that have been dumped upon us. This building gives me hope for a bright Nashville future moving forward, respecting our past at the same time, creating new visions in this one building. I'm a fan of boutique hotels, as well as the medium height buildings that have a place in our downtown cityscape. This project brings attention to this third avenue block, this grand architecture. The building is art, a building that has been without vision for way too long. Our Caller, you have 30 seconds. Architectural art produced by local with a vision and a solid track record in the Nashville brand. This project should not only be approved, but approved with excitement for the Nashville future. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Sean. Next caller, Sean. Sean, do we have the next caller? Oh. Chairman, you have the next caller now. Excellent, thank you. And caller, please state your name and address and you have two minutes and you may begin. Great, thank you, Mr. Chairman. This is Freddie O'Connell, Metro Council District 19. I live at 1821 Sixth Avenue North um, and I'm calling in support of the project. Uh, this one is an interesting one. It's in the context of Third Avenue North where it intersects medium. Um, where you do have the existing height context uh, anchored at the Stallman and Indigo Hotel. Um, and we've had just a recent conversation about sort of how we wrap the corners there. Um, with this particular building, which I've been in many times, as I knew uh, the previous owner well, Juan uh, Choi and his family, um, who had actually converted it to a residence at one point. Uh, it's a beautiful building, well worth preserving, and I think uh, the conditions of the project proposal demonstrate that in many ways it's at greater risk for demolition uh, if we don't allow the project to carry with it some additional height. Um, in this case, I think it will be a successful adaptive reuse project. I think it does prompt both the commission and Metro Historic uh, as well as preservation advocates that we ought to be um, looking at that entire corridor, that stretch of Third Avenue North, uh, more holistically, because we've had to respond reactively to a couple of recent project proposals. And if you look south from Union, down Third, um, there is a lot of context there that is worth preserving, um, that is in many ways, I think, more at risk for demolition. But here uh, on either side of the street, we've got adaptive reuse proposals for both the cash and ore building and now the Federal Reserve building. Uh, and I think the design, especially uh, with planning's recommendation to preserve the interior gives a, a great amount of pedestrian scale consideration uh, as well as preserving that remarkable interior space for generations to come. And so I think that this is a project proposal worth giving approval to um, I've had extensive conversations with both Metro Historic as well as Historic Nashville um, and agree with their overall concerns. And I, I hope that we can collaboratively uh, work together to address more of those concerns in a proactive way for the remainder of that corridor. Uh, and I thank everybody for your time and consideration. Thank you, Councilman. We really appreciate you calling in today. And thank you for your comments. Next caller, Sean. Um, to reduce feedback would be immensely helpful. Chair, we're just reminding this caller to okay. mute the meeting behind them, and so I'll say that um, for the benefit of the listening audience. If you call in, make sure once you hear the voice of the operator that you are muting your live stream so we don't get feedback. And with that, we have uh, the next caller. Thank you, Sean. Very good reminder. We appreciate that. And so, caller, you have two minutes. Please state your name and address, and you may begin. Good evening, my name is Philip Martin, 207 Third Avenue North. It's my residence. I have many buildings in the area and businesses. 
and want to tell you that this is very, very special that Icon and Mr. Miller are taking on this building like the other buildings they've taken on. I've done similar buildings. This is a lot of, a lot of work and to preserve it and to bring it back and to make it useful to the community for we can enjoy, as someone said, another 100 plus years is just remarkable. I'm very much in favor of it, extremely excited about it. And my neighbors are extremely excited about it. There's very few of us that have our homes in that area. A few of us that do um, are real excited about this going forward and real excited about what Mr. Miller has done with his previous buildings. This kind of work is so expensive, it's absolutely amazing. Our historic group downtown is a wonderful group, Tim and Robin, and, and what makes me so concerned is trying to make that mix with all the great work that they have done uh, for our good city and make it mix with where we have to go today in business and for Mr. Miller and Icon to take this on, to take this project on with the expense. But it's a lot, lot, lot less expensive doing the new hotels that are down there. All the, all the fancy- Paula, you have 30 seconds. Everything else has been supported by Nash with brand new buildings. And here, this building will be a boutique hotel that will keep the Federal Reserve Building, which is absolutely amazing. 1958, it was closed. Absolutely amazing because that was, had gold, gold in it, silver in it, bars, and all kinds of cool things, which we will now be able to know that history, experience that history. I'll be able to bring my grandchildren in to talk about it, that how special. Caller, your time is up. Please finish your thought. Thank you. How Nashville, Tennessee was thought about even way back then to have the Federal Reserve Building here and now preserved. Again, thank you all, Commission and everybody, for all your hard work. And Thank you. We appreciate it. And um, Sean, next caller. Chairman, you have the next caller. Excellent. Welcome. We appreciate you calling in. You have two minutes. Please state your name and address and you may begin. My name is Juan Choi and I reside on, at uh, 906 uh, 906 uh, South Serrano Avenue in Los Angeles, uh, California. I am calling uh, to support the project's approval. I wrote a letter to the commission members uh, uh, earlier outlining my support for the height and the use of this project uh, and to ensure the preservation of this property. I was the previous owner of this property and I sold this property to the applicant uh, Bill Miller, uh, in support of the vision that he had uh, for the project, um, uh, for the current project. Uh, I do have reservations about uh, the, uh, that consistent with historic, uh, historical commission's concerns uh, that has to do with the design of the lobby. And uh, since I've written the letter, I have been in communication with Bill Miller, and he has assured me that he'll do everything in his power, uh, including speaking with um, the structural engineers uh, that have done the previous work uh, to ensure that the design element that I found object objectionable about the lobby itself, the structural beams and the protrusion of the stairway uh, can be designed out. So I uh, appreciated um, uh, his comments about it and the commitment to the historical preservation of this property. So Caller, you have 30 seconds. So I just wanted to share those uh, thoughts uh, with the uh, commission. That's it. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. We appreciate you calling in very much. Sean, next caller. have the next caller. Excellent. And welcome, and you have two minutes to speak. Please state your name and address, and you may begin. Chairman Atkins, thank you very much. My name is Brian Taylor. My current home, my home address is 5317 Overton Road. 
Nashville, 37220. I am calling today in support of this project. Um, I've been a commercial real estate broker for 16 years. I was a downtown resident for 14 of the last 18, as well as, I guess you could say, an activist on behalf of the success of downtown, uh, particularly the, the, the historic districts, uh, Lower Broad, First and Second Avenue. Um, again, I do support the project. Uh, I'm very familiar with this building. Uh, 20, 25 years ago, I've been through the building. I am familiar with the building's current state. Uh, I'm familiar with what the current owner wants to do with the building. I think it would be a shame to tear this building down. I think uh, the downtown world, in its ever-changing environment, needs to keep the facade of this building intact. And I think what this owner has done uh, in this design and his design team have have created a, a wonderful element of continuing the historic pedestrian experience, the classic columns this building has. Hello, you have 30 seconds. And I think what they've done to create density, to create the pedestrian experience while keeping the character of this historic building there on Third Avenue in, in downtown is, is, is key. Uh, I hope that the commissioners, you will support this project. Uh, it's something we need to keep. It's a great design. Caller, your time is up. Please finish your thoughts. Thank you. Uh, with that, uh, I'll end my comments, but again, I hope that you'll, you'll support this project. Um, I think it's important to the design element and this area specifically in downtown. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Sean, next caller. Mm -hmm. Chairman, you have the next caller. Excellent. And caller, you have uh, two minutes to speak. Please state your name and your address. Thank you for calling. You may begin. Sure. My name is uh, Tim Strobel. I live at 301 Demumbrian Street, uh, Unit 916, the Encore Condominium. Uh, I'm calling basically in support of the project's approval. Um, I'm very impressed with the design and that it is it, able to keep the historical architecture while adapting uh, to a modern hotel that I mean, personally I think will enhance down, that part of downtown Nashville. Uh, I'm also familiar with some other of the Miller's projects here in Nashville and they've all just been outstanding. Um, I'm a native Nashvilleian. Uh, I've been a downtown resident for the last 10 years and uh, most of my professional career has been in the hospitality industry. Um, I joined the staff at the Hermitage Hotel in 1981 right after uh, it was reopened as a historical property, and it was exciting to work in that particular uh, hotel and see what can be done to preserve one of Nashville's gyms, and that's what's going to be happening here. Um, my professional career, after 25 years, I worked on the sales and marketing force for the, both the Nashville Convention Center and the Music City Center, and uh, Nashville definitely continues to need more downtown hotel rooms. Uh, not only for the convention industry, but for uh, many other purposes that, you know, uh, that the convention industry draws people into these other hotels. Uh, this is very true of the boutique hotels, too, uh, like the Federal Reserve Hotel project that's uh, being discussed. Um, and uh, I just want to thank the uh, Planning Commission very much for your time and um, hope that you, too, will support the project's approval. Thank you. Thank you, sir. And Sean, next caller. Chairman, you have the next caller. Thank you, and you have two minutes. Please state your name and address, and you may begin. Hi, my name is Jeff Reimer, and I live at 309 Church Street at the Exchange Loft, and I've been president of the HOA of the Exchange 
since we opened 15 years ago. And I also own property on 2nd Avenue. And I am the owner of the Reimer Gallery on 5th Avenue. And I want to say that I am in support of this project. Having watched Nashville grow over these last 15 years, particularly in our corridor where there was no neighborhood, now we have a vibrant neighborhood. The other boutique hotels that have opened up in the last three or four years, this will be a welcome addition. And the idea that it's going to connect the pedestrian corridors all the way down from 3rd up through Banker's Alley, Sprinter's Alley, through the Arcade, up to the Avenue of the Arts, and on to CPAC and the other things that we have on this north section of Broadway, I think this will be more than a welcome addition. I think it will be a vital addition in the preservation of the quality and the historic nature of the architecture in the area and will be very, very much welcome. And I just want to let you know that I support it and thank you for the consideration. Thank you. Sean, next caller. Chairman, we don't, we don't have any additional callers in the queue at this time. Um, so we'll uh, defer to your direction on where you want to go next. Let's give it one more minute just to make sure and then we'll proceed. Um, but while we wait on, on the next call, caller, um, I know that maybe Director Kemp is, is, is Tim from the Historic Commission want to speak? Director Kemp. Uh, yes, I do believe that uh, uh, Director Walker has a prepared statement and he is uh, an attendee. And so if he could be unmuted, um, we would welcome his, his comments. Perfect, Sean. Chair, I will confirm that we have not received any additional calls in this interlude, um, and we have unmuted uh, Director Walker, and he can speak when you recognize him. Excellent. Mr. Walker, you're recognized. Uh, thank you, Chair, and, and good afternoon, Planning Commission members, and, and thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak. Uh, I'm Tim Walker, the Executive Director of the Metro Historical Commission, and as the City's Advisor on Historic Preservation Issues, the Metro Historical Commission staff recommends disapproval of the request for additional height at 226 Third Avenue North. Based on the fact that the additional height does not meet the requirements and spirit of the DTC and the federal standards for treatment of historic properties, and because the addition will cause the building to lose its national register listing and will likely set a precedent for many other unprotected historic properties and the downtown code. The Federal Reserve Building is currently listed in the National Register of Historic Places, both individually and as part of the Nashville Financial Historic District. Constructed in 1922, the building was designed by Atlanta-based architect A10 Eck Brown in association with the Nashville architectural firm Marin Holman, and is significant for its architecture being one of the best examples of the classical revival style in our city. And although I commend the owner for his plan to remove the floor that was inserted into the original bank lobby, the plans proposed require intrusions into the space, including a stairwell needed for circulation and a pair of support columns needed to carry the weight of the 14th floor addition. If not for the additional height requested, the support columns may not be needed or may not need to be as large. However, these intrusions will adversely affect the historic lobby. At 17 stories, the height of this proposal does not meet the standards noted in the DTC's core historic district for mid-block buildings, nor does the 14-story addition on the roof of the historic structure meet the required setback from the historic building space. As proposed, the building will be 20 feet and 5 inches taller than the rooftop mechanical penthouse on the Stallman building, the adjacent structure to the north and across the alley and the Stallman building is a corner building where the DTC allows greater height. Our department and the federal standards support adaptive reuse as long as new construction and alterations do not overwhelm the historic building. This proposal compromises the historic integrity of the building and is not historic preservation. Furthermore, it does not meet the spirit of the DTC. 
I fear this proposal will set a new standard for MIP block buildings in the core historic district. In the coming years, we all either lose more historic buildings on both Third Avenue North and in the DTC, given this new standard for modifications, or those buildings that survive will become a pedestal for glass towers. I hope you will consider the president. You'll be setting with the approval of this plan and disapprove the proposal. And uh, thank you again. I want to add, I'll stay on if there are any other questions now or later in the meeting. Thanks. Thank you, Director Walker. We appreciate that. And uh, thank you for your time tonight. And so, Sean, let's make sure one more time there were no other callers in the queue. Chair, we have received no other calls on this item. Okay. Excellent. And I believe that uh, the council member, uh, the, well, the council member spoke on the phone, but he is not uh, on the call as a participant. I don't believe so we will leave two minutes uh the the applicant has two minutes for rebuttal thank you chairman it's daryl talbert president of icon again um i appreciate tim's comments and uh, he and robin have actually been very generous with their time and, and helping us work our way through this but you know I, I i would disagree in terms of there are times that the letter or the regulations don't always meet the intent. And I think we all would agree that the intent for all of us as we sit here tonight is preservation. We've taken all that we can in terms of input from the real world, um, contemporary Nashville business world, which is we have to have 100 or more keys to have a good operator in a boutique hotel. It has to pencil so that the project can be lent on because it's a 60 or $70 million project. It has to be ADI, ADA compliant. It has to meet with ingress and egress requirements for health, life, safety. It has to meet planning requirements. It has to meet a number of different things. So where those roads cross is where we're at tonight. Um, it started, like I said, at over 21 stories and it's been whittled away to 14 and it, and it functions. Um, we've activated the alley. We've um, re-energized the alley, brought lighting and people, we've preserved and returned the interior to its original glory. And we've even found a tool, which a lot of the people don't understand is although it comes off the national registry, it will be preserved in perpetuity with a facade um, easement, as well as an interior easement. Easement may not be the right word, but we have a contractual obligation that will enjoin the property to never be touched and protect it for centuries to come for Nashvilleians. So, Again, in adaptive reuse, it's critical that we don't let the perfect be the enemy of good. And in this instance, um, with us as the builder, user, owner, and experts in adaptive reuse, should we not be able to move forward with the project, the building is absolutely at risk. And then we will all be you have 30 seconds. And then we will all be scratching our heads as to what was more important, the letter of the regulation or the great need that we have to preserve Nashville history. And to that end, we look forward to working with Historic Nashville should we go forward uh, with doing a mini multimedia museum sharing the story of Nashville's uh, financial history. And we, we hope tonight that we get your support and we can move forward on this and get it up in the next couple of years. Thank you. And I, I uh, do not see the Councilman O'Connell is on the call and he testified earlier. So seeing that when else wishing to speak i declare the public hearing closed and so we are now opening it up for discussion amongst uh, commissioners how about we start with uh, vice chair far uh, uh, chairman forgive me this is uh lucy oh, oh. um yes. I, I just i wanted to clarify um would you like for me to speak for a moment about the the issue yes. so legal we, issue that was uh, okay i uh i almost forgot it but uh thank you director uh Please go ahead and, and speak. You sent out an email okay. to the about ex parte communication. I did receive um, some inquiries from several commissioners um, regarding our rules around ex parte um, communications. Um, and in this instance, um, the discussions were between a, the, a commissioner and a separate department. And because the commission is in a decision making, a final decision making role today, we felt it really important to ensure that for purposes of transparency and the integrity of our 
deliberations, that we be very clear in the record as to what conversations that we have had to make sure that all of the commissioners have benefit um, to that information. And um, after consulting with legal, they recommended that um, we just ask the commissioners if there were any discussions uh, that were had outside of the public hearing state who it was with and the general nature of the conversation. And at that point, we believe you will have met the standard to, to proceed to, to vote. Um, but we would ask that you disclose that information. This is not meant to be punitive. It, it's just meant to make sure that we, um, that, that we are Thank protecting you, the integrity Let's, of our review. Make sure that we have Yes, so thank you. Uh, and can, Director, can you hear me? Yes, sir, I can. Okay, so let's, <clears throat> uh, let's have legal state exactly. I, I know you did, but let's make sure we're, I wanna make sure that we're not trying, that we don't violate any um, laws here. So uh, our, uh, Mr. Poole, our attorney is on the line and so, just please tell, reiterate to the commissioners what the director has said, um, and if there's anything else that you would like to add. Uh, thank you, Chairman. This is Quan uh, Poole from the Metro Legal Department. Um, I, I was having some sound issues, so unfortunately I didn't hear everything that um, Director Kemp's stated, but you know, basically the issue at um, the rule, planning rule at play is is rule 4C, which is handles ex, ex parte communications. And the main thing here is that you just disclose the, the statements. Uh, if you happen to have an ex parte communication, which is a communication between a commission member who has to decide an issue and um, another person without, without that occurring in a public hearing, that's considered an ex parte communication. And so the issue is not, it doesn't prohibit the commissioner from vote. It doesn't uh, create a conflict of interest. It, it doesn't um, in any way uh, affect the actual vote. Uh, the rule just simply states that the member of the commission shall report on that contact in full to the commission prior to any action being taken on the matter. So again, it, it doesn't affect any commissioners, commissioner's ability to vote at all. It's just that for the purposes of the record, we want it to be clear um, what conversations were had or what conversations might have occurred. So that way, if if there is some subsequent appeal, everything's on the record and members or fellow commissioners can consider that in, the, in their deliberations. So I'm certainly here to, to answer any questions that anyone has. Um, but again, that's, that's the basic rule. Thank you, Mr. Poole. And thank you, Director. We appreciate your analysis. And so now we're going to open it up to disclose those ex parte communications. If you will verbally state uh, that you've had one, if you'll raise your hand, your icon hand. Um, and then so we have Commissioner Johnson, you're recognized first. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I would like to disclose uh, as a newly appointed uh, historic zoning uh, representative, uh, historic zoning commissioner representing Metro Planning Commission, I reached out to history uh, commission staff, executive uh, director, Tim Walker, and also I spoke with uh, administrator, uh, Robin Ziegler, and to inquire uh, general history about uh, downtown COA and uh, historical overlay, uh, historical, historical subdistrict, as well as if, uh, since this is a historical building, if historical staff got any uh, involvement or uh, input about this building. So uh, that's uh, my ex parte communication. I just want to disclose that. Thank you. Thank you. And Commissioner Gobble. I can never find the mute button as quickly as I'd like. Um, yeah, I um, I would like to say, you know, I've talked to Director Walker. Um, he and I uh, have talked for decades about downtown and downtown code. And 
applications. We try to keep our conversations related to policy in general about downtown. I also talked, I also reached out to Ann Roberts, who, as many of you know, was a former director of the Historic Commission, but also well respected and very active in downtown. Uh, all of our conversations was was mostly policy and, and dealing with uh, the overall situation and how we really need to revisit the downtown code. But that's, that's my disclosure. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Sims. Uh, yes, um, Tim reached out to me requesting that I talk to him, but I called Lucy to make sure that that was within the uh, commissioner's policy. I felt uncomfortable about returning his call um, and I told him that, and he was very gracious and told me that that was fine. He totally understood. Also, I've reached out to Juan Choi because he's a close personal friend and about the history of the building. And we mostly chatted as friends do, but I wanted to disclose that. Thank you, Commissioner. Anyone else? Any other commissioners? Make sure we get everybody. If you'll raise your I, hand or verbally. This oh, is yeah, I don't know I'm if you saw sorry, my hand. Um, Tibbs. There yeah, it is. I see it now. You're okay. Ready, sorry. <laughs> That's okay. I'm on cell phone, so I don't know how everything works. But uh, yeah, I too um, spoke with um, uh, Director Walker, but uh, it was really brief, actually. Um, uh, we were short on time, so it was strictly fact based. Uh, uh, pretty much just showed me the facts of what the presentation was. Uh, we didn't get into much more after that, but it was pretty much just strictly fact based. So that was it. Thank you, Commissioner Tibbs. Anyone else? I want to make sure we get everybody. You raise your hand or verbally state you want to speak. Seeing no one else, so we are we are now into um, the discussion mode, and so now we're back to uh, Commission uh, Vice Chair Far. You want to start us off with the discussion? Sure, I was ready, and then I got distracted with all of that. But um, yes, um, so this is an exciting project. I'm, I have uh, eyed this building for a long time, eyed this street for a long time because it's one of the few parts of downtown Nashville where you really do still get the feel for historic buildings um, or what our historic uh, downtown must have looked like. Um, I'm also a very long-standing employee of the Federal Reserve System, um, and I love our Federal Reserve buildings, our old Federal Reserve buildings all over the country. Obviously, this is one that we haven't had for many years, but um, it gives me a, a special attachment to wanting to see it preserved. Um, I wanted to clarify a few things. Um, one, I thought someone mentioned that the building was on the historic, that the building would be taken off the historic, I think the applicant said this, the building would be taken off the historic registry with this addition. But my understanding is that the building is not on the historic registry. Does that just mean that it would no longer be eligible to be placed on? But it's not on a historic registry at this time. Is that correct? I guess that's a question for staff. Eric, can you clarify? I mean, the, the, the building is listed on the National Register, but it is not included in an overlay that would, that would protect it from being demolished. And so perhaps there's some terminology there. Um, Eric, can you add anything? Absolutely, Director. So uh, there are two things we're dealing with here. So there is the historic register, which is a building can be placed on. There's also uh, the two designations, the overlays that I referred to before, which are the historic preservation overlay and the historic landmark overlay. Those two overlays are uh, the protective uh, things you're referencing before. The, um, uh, the other is just uh, the, the National Register list, which doesn't confer any local protections. Okay. Okay, that helps a lot. Um, okay, I'm just making a few notes to keep track of this stuff. Um, I guess another question for staff, and I guess I would like to hear your thoughts um, based on, on um, the comments from Director Walker about the proposed height um, and what staff's thinking was on that um, and some of the comments made about how this is inconsistent with the downtown code 
um, and how you reconcile that, you know, with thinking about the surrounding heights um, of, of the buildings that are around this subject property. Well, well thanks for that question. Um, you know, I think reasonable people who care very much about our cityscape can disagree and debate passionately about preservation and design. And, and we see that all over the country. And I, I think it's a, actually a healthy discourse. Um, so while this discussion has been difficult um, and we may have competing goals, I am heartened by the, the passion and, and sort of has been shown for this particular building, which is a very powerful architectural feature in the community. Um, I mean, it's a great building. Um, I do welcome the comments of my colleague, you know, Mr. Walker, and I regret that our views diverged on this case, but I think we share a goal to make sure that downtown is interesting and has old and new um, features. To your question about height, my first priority was to ensure that the streetscape view, the streetscape perspective of the building is outstanding. And that's why it's so important to preserve the interior lobby, but also the facade. And so preserving that original structure accomplishes this goal. In my view, an important but secondary factor for how the building height is perceived from the street. Um, and so here we wanted a structure that is generally consistent with the context, with the stallman as an important feature there to generally, generally relate to, but I, I did not think that a, an absolute match was important. I mean, if you think about standing next to a, a building on a tight urban street and you look up, how, how, how do you perceive height? Um, I, I think that, you know, that, that the marginal differences between the stallman and what's proposed were less important um, from my perspective. Um, we really wanted to see the addition as having um, a, uh, we wanted to perceive it as having a different material in contrast so that we could really highlight the historic structure and celebrate it. I think 30 years ago, preservation theory was to try to mimic or match the original structure, which is less interesting, but I also think doesn't really show the structure well. In terms of the comments about um, sort of consistency with the downtown code, um, council approved the downtown code and gave to the planning commission and the design review committees a process for accomplishing great design downtown. And that is through the height modification process and through the bonus process. So the height modification process is available to applicants to pursue. I do think that um, it is really important for us to revisit the downtown code and update it, not just to, to better understand our historic preservation goals and implement them, but to address other goals as well. And that is in our work program. So I know that's general. Were there any, was there anything more specific I could ask Eric to answer Commissioner Farr? I don't think so. I mean, I guess just in general, I mean, something that, that stood out to me was the comment about the fact that um, that it was lower than the Stallman. I understand not necessarily thinking every building should be the same, but what is the thinking about should more height be concentrated on corners versus the interior of the block? I mean, I think, I don't know that that really matters to me, but I'm curious if that's one of the principles that we think about. It is, it is an important principle. I mean, generally, and you see this even when we review projects in neighborhoods, we tend to want to add the density to the corner and then lower it um, mid-block. And that, that's absolutely a principle here. I think in this instance, with the existence of the alley, the relationship of the stallman, the relationship to the buildings across the street, you know, we found that the height was generally consistent with the environment. And, you know, it is a downtown context. So I do think that's, it's not the only factor, it's a, it is a factor, um, it's a factor to think about. Okay. Um, no, I think that I think that that's all good. I mean, I think um, I think that the fact that there is nothing out there protecting this building, um, and you know, I thought that the comments made earlier about uh, from some of the um, in the public hearing, you know, it's um, we don't want to let the <laughs> perfect be the enemy of the good. I think there are, you know, I do have some concern about such a significant height, um, and this is a 
you know, it is a, a, a narrow street. Um, but I also think that preserving this building is really important. Um, I hate to see us lose yet another historic, one of our few buildings left in downtown Nashville that are truly historic. I'd hate to see that lost. Um, I'd rather think long-term, I think as, as was mentioned earlier about what we can do to protect the other assets that we still have in this area um, so that, you know, we aren't setting a precedent for completely changing the scale of the entire street. Um, but I am inclined to support staff's recommendation um, uh, based on those reasons. Thank you, Vice Chair. And how about Commissioner Gobble? Uh, quick question for Eric. Uh, you mentioned the July 9th meeting. Who was invited to that meeting? Absolutely, uh, Commissioner. So uh, the July meeting that I mentioned was uh, the required community meeting for an overall height modification. Um, in that, we invited, uh, they were invited via um, mail, um, everyone within 300 feet of this property. Um, in addition to that, we also forwarded the um, the invitation to uh, members of Historic National Inc. and uh, to uh, certain members of Metro Historic. Um, my understanding is some of them had difficulty joining, but at least one was able to make it into the meeting to hear it, and it was recorded, so we sent it after the meeting had been completed as well. Uh, the, um, how many people attended the meeting? I mean, I know it was virtual, but... Uh, I believe that four that were not associated with the project are staff. Okay, uh, we've got to do a better job of communicating downtown. I live within 200 feet of this site, and I don't recall getting that. I asked my neighbors, and no one recalls getting it. Um, and, you know, we've got, so I do want us, as we're dealing with the urban neighborhood, I mean, the downtown neighborhood, we pay attention to it. All uh, right. So, that's just a comment on the side. Moving on, I, I have not had, I've been on this commission for three and a half years and I've not had a project that that is, um, that bothered me as much as this one in many different ways. Uh, I, like I said, I can look out my window and see the site. I'm 200 feet away. I am, uh, the, I am very familiar with the building. I looked at it before Juan Choi bought it and tried to redevelop it. When I found out he was interested in selling it, I kind of pulled out what we did and know that this is an extraordinarily difficult building to redevelop and you can't really redevelop it without adding some vertical expansion to it. Uh, my, as, a, as somebody who's worked very closely with Director Walker and others and you know, very passionate about historic work. I like vertical expansions to not be visible from the street. Um, once they are visible from the street, then how far do you go and how does it work? It's only a 50 foot wide street. Building to building is 50 feet. And so you get a very narrow view of this site. Um, I'm very, I, you know, again, I respect Director Walker, but I want to see this building, even if we're just getting the facade in the lobby or part of the lobby uh, is preserved, um, you know, that's something. And so I'm really struggling with this, but I'm inclined to support staff's recommendation. Thank you, Commissioner Haynes. So I too am struggling with this. Um, if I understand correctly, and I'll defer to Eric to clarify this, this building is, uh, or this site has a potential of six stories of bonus height to get us to 10. And so they're asking for an additional seven to get to 17 total. Is that correct? Uh, if I can clarify that, uh, Mr. Commissioner. So uh, the height of the site in terms of the base height allowed by the downtown code is six stories. Um, they can bonus uh, four stories to a total of 10 stories while still being inside the uh, confines of the bonus height program. Um, what they're asking for is, you're correct, the increment between that 10 and the 17. Okay, thank you. Um, and I certainly understand adaptive reuse is hard and expensive. Um, I don't necessarily like the applicant saying, 
he's got to have 17 or this project doesn't work. They've already bought the building. They should have factored this into their thought process previously. Um, I happen to agree with Director Walker um, on the height and would really like to see this be one or two or even three stories lower than the Stallman building. So the Stallman building could maintain its significant presence in the skyline. Um, so I, I'll listen to the rest of my commissioners, but at this point in time, I'm not sure I could support staff's recommendation at the 17 stories. Thank you, Commissioner Johnson. Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, I too have, uh, you know, having a hard time uh, deciding uh, this one because this is a very unique uh, class case to me because back in June, we did have a bonus height determination. That was uh, within, you know, bonus height. So they are not uh, asking any extra height. So this one was a first height modification proposal. So going, you know, uh, way over allowed bonus height. So that itself is unique. So I think, you know, if uh, the bottom th three stories are not such a neoclassic uh, design, and then different uh, character, you know, on top might be easier to kind of leaning towards recommendations, but in a way it's a really unique um, design. But when I read uh, the qualification to approve a uh, height modification, it says we may approve for exceptional design, including but not limited to unique architecture. Yes, unique architecture for sure, because it has really nice uh, zigzag and, you know, so first uh, thought I did not understand why that zigzag so many things and, you know, glass glazing and so forth. And then after I really get into deep dive, oh, that zigzag makes sense because right next to the Solomon building, so in order to kind of block the view from the building next door, but yet get the light in. So that's why those, you know, angles. So I understand everybody was so excited about, uh, you know, this addition, but at the same time, you know, if we do have uh, those kind of really um, distinctive design on top of such a neoclassical design, can we really say it's a preservation? I mean, I do appreciate the effort in preserve, and it would be much, much better to be preserved instead of, uh, you know, destroy or, you know, tear down. That would be a shame. So this one is really, really difficult. So I did, you know, uh, study if is there any other uh, buildings in any other cities, you know, where they try to uh, restore historical buildings and then have some addition. So I, uh, you know, found one very, very uh, interesting uh, building, which is in Manhattan called Hearst Tower. It appeared to be like a bottom six story is like a Gothic, very classic uh, architecture. And then they put uh, like a glass uh, cactus looking, you know, a glass tower on top of a historical building. So literally, you know, the future meets history. So according to the um, interior, the Secretary of Interior Standard, so in a way they do, so their recommendation of the Secretary of Interior 
it is kind of contradicting because it says yes, uh, they must new addition must preserve the building history character, form significant material features, and it must be compatible with matching size, scale, and design and of the historic building. But at the same time, so new additions and related to new construction that meet standards can be any architectural style, traditional, contemporary, or simplified version of a historic building. So it, everything is uh, contradictory in a way, and so it's part of our interpretation. So it got me thinking, because this is a one building, but it is downtown core. So since 80s, we are very intentional about preserving history and historical building. At the same time, revitalizing downtown, uh, you know, give bonus height and encourage development. So if allowing this very unique, different, distinctive um, restoration project will really encouraging this type of, you know, uh, future development. I mean, if everybody's excited, if so, that's the direction we are going to go, that might be okay, but I'm not sure, you know, if like just a matter of second for us, our commissioners deciding uh, kind of, you know, trigger those kind of development. So I feel like it might be better as we had a music role, you know, vision session to kind of for us and stakeholders and a community at large to kind of envision what kind of, you know, preservation and renovation and development and we have. Because we do have, you know, all the downtown calls, but it's not really specific. We do have, it's kind of model interpretation. So we don't have any kind of standards in a way. So I think we may need to revisit that. So I am, as of right now, I'm really having a hard time, you know, which way to go. So I will keep listening. Let me offer, if you don't mind, Chair, if I may, I think ahead, we, would be, we would be very open to having a study that talks about the different ways that we can accomplish preservation and whether, and, you know, sort of have a conversation about why the kinds of contrasting buildings that you see proposed here and that we've seen elsewhere in the country may or, or may not work um, for Nashville on a broader scale. I think it's certainly appropriate for a single project, but I think the broader conversation is important. What I would say though is it's really important and I'd ask our attorney to weigh in here that if we advertise a process um, that the applicant um, have an opportunity to work through the process as noticed when they enter into our review. And so I, I don't think it's appropriate to stop, um, you know, sort of midway through a review and say, we're going to do a study. I think if the commission wanted to direct the staff to do that type of work, I would recommend taking action on this project, but then also giving us guidance as to the kinds of things you would want us to look at in a downtown code review, but we just can't, can't do it in the middle of a review of an application. Yes, and director, I, I think that the commission's been extremely consistent on, you know, we can't, and I've, I know it's a, probably a bad example, but you can't move the, the goalpost when you're in the middle of, of a game, right? The, the goalposts are, are where they are, and um, it, during a particular, um, and, and that's a, a way to get sued too, I think. And so, good, good point, director. All right, let's keep up the discussion, and, and then uh, there's a lot of discussion. Uh, there's a lot more to go. So, um, Commissioner Lawson, you want to go next? Well, you know, I don't know what I could contribute to the mix because all of the points that have been expressed are very excellent points. My immediate reaction is that, and I know that there is uh, the danger in that if it's not approved and there are things that the developer could do in terms of raising the whole building, and doing something else, 
I think that the 17 stories is too high in that particular corridor. Um, and <clears throat> you, you, I, I feel, I do feel between a rock and a hard place because I think it is still too tall a building in that corridor. And we, we need to, to see how aesthetically and, and everything else uh, fits. Uh, and I know we don't want to do a downtown study in the middle of this, but still, I, I, I'm going to listen to what everyone else has to say. Right now, I, I don't think it's an appropriate uh, development. Thank you. Councilor Murphy. Thank you, Chair. Um, I wanted to to confirm with staff, I, I think I've heard this right, that there, like, it, this building could be torn down uh, by pulling a demo permit tomorrow. Is that accurate? Yes. yes. Okay. And when y'all say they are um, uh, preserving the interior of the building, I know that it specifically says that uh, they're going to restore the lobby. What about other parts of the interior? What could you, could you kind of give me a little bit more of an idea of, is it all three stories as the interior? Um, I believe there's a ballroom, the bank, or not the bank, the vault, or is it just that actual lobby? I would look for Eric to add some more detail, but our goal was to provide a, if you look at the conditions, we have a condition that requires the preservation of the interior, sort of the grand lobby, which is that big character defining space that's so important. Um, and currently it is partitioned in several levels. And so through the renovation and through the project, they're going to be restoring the lobby. And so the goal of what the current condition that we have would be to put a mechanism in place at use and occupancy that does that work, that preservation work. But I do think that the applicant has expressed an openness if we wanted to refine that condition to include more specific architectural and historic details in that work. Um, I had hoped that that might come from historic staff um, because I think that 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 these are the preservation elements. And so I do think there's an opportunity to refine that condition. Does that answer your question? Yes, that 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 actually does. I, I would like to see that fleshed out a little bit more. And I do wish that historic had filled that role for for planning since that is more of historic's charge and their um, mission and and relationship in the metro balance of departments. Um, because I think that there are, I, I've only been in this building once or twice, and, and I think that there are probably other things that could be called out and made sure that were, were preserved. Because honestly, the way I, I look at this is when I'm, when I'm running around downtown um, for work during the day um, or, or with friends at night, you know, some of the alleys do not look necessarily uh, where I want to walk down them in my high heels or uh, by myself in a safe manner. Um, and I think anytime that we can encourage these buildings to activate their alleys and activate them as uh, pedestrian um, ways to get through them, not just that they're well lit and safe, but actually encouraging that as, as a public space is exciting. That is something that when I travel, I love to stumble across alleys that, that have a little life to them and are not just the back of the house. Um, I don't see the the issue of this being a mid block building um, when it comes to the height. I really feel like it's it it, it honestly I, I got confused on what side of the alley was on before seeing the renderings and, and it's I just I see it more as as towards the end cap of the block than being mid mid block um, and the part that seems like it would be visible from the street the most at least from when I walk up and down that street and then comparing it and thinking about the renderings we saw is we're keeping this facade that is historic, that is fabulous, that is wonderful, that we would lose otherwise. 
and to give it life. Um, because when I walk, have walked by it pre COVID, you know, it kind of, I, I found myself walking faster because there wasn't as much to look at. And I think that this will give more interest to that building to give it the life that it once had and should have again. Uh, I love the fact that one of our conditions is that there will be public access to the lobby and a publicly visible display expa explaining the history of the of the building and hopefully of the financial district. Because again, when you think about the, or at least when I was little Kathleen, she, you know, we went on a downtown tour of 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 Nashville, and and this is an area that doesn't have a lot of stops. And I think this will encourage tourists and and school groups to learn more about Nashville, learn more about our history, and learn about a building that has not been open to the public in a very long time. And and that's something that we don't get anywhere else. We we don't have that opportunity in a lot of the buildings downtown. And new development very rarely is going to provide that. And and that almost you know where when we're balancing what 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 kind of bonuses we're talking about, what are the trade-offs that the public is willing to do for private development? That's something that sticks out to me. Um, so I'm I'm okay with that. Um, I'm okay the fact that it feels like two different buildings from the renderings. I feel like if I looked at it from the street, that it would almost look like, oh, that's a that's a hotel or a building behind it. So it does not offend me. The the view shed of that does not. Um, I understand that other commissioners are having trouble with that, but it it just simply doesn't bother me. And in downtown, sometimes I feel like, you know, I can't tell whether a building is 72 stories or or just 17 stories. So so I, I'm I'm not having the the struggle that other commissioners have. I will I would like to see the conditions maybe tightened up a little bit to make sure that we're preserving all the architectural history that we can. But um, at this point, I'm I'm I lean towards staff recommendation and, and approval of this completely. Thank you, Council Lady. Uh, next is Commissioner Sims. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, I have a question. Um, I guess this is to to Lucy or to. The, the staff, how was the historic commission involved in this? And we got the letter of showing they weren't in support, but what process was used to engage them? Eric, do you want to talk about the public meeting and the DRC work and sort of how you approach projects like this? Absolutely. So to back up, this this project has been um, considered or at least in, in some form um, uh, uh, presented to the uh, um, to Metro Historic for for quite a while, I believe, about a year ago, uh, with the first conversations, um, perhaps even longer than that. Um, but in terms of this uh, more formal process, um, the uh, uh, community meeting uh, we did forward the invitation to attend to uh, Metro Historic uh, staff as well as Historic Nashville Inc. Um, in addition, uh, the uh, Metro Historic has two or has, has membership on the um, design review committee that NDHA runs, uh, which is what I referred to before in the presentation. Um, they do have the ability to vote on that as well. Um, in addition to the conversations that have been had over the last, as I mentioned, um, around a year. So they have been engaged at various points of this process, um, formally and informally. And so they did have an opportunity to address the design elements. Yeah. Yes. If you, Commissioner Sims, um, we had meetings, but you may want to ask the applicant or historic to speak to that. Um, I know that the applicant did, did outreach with both Metro Historic and also the um, the H and I um, uh, team, the H and I community group. That's a good suggestion. Um, Mr. Walker, may I talk, may you answer that question? Can you? Mr. Walker, you're recognized. Chair, we're, on, we're working on unmuting him now. Just give us a moment and he is, he is free to speak. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we were approached by the owner about a year ago and have been in discussions, but it was all around the 17th story. 
uh, building. Uh, that's the only proposal they've really discussed with us. They weren't willing to lower the height uh, because they have been telling us that that height was necessary for them to move forward with this project. Thank you very much. Um, with that comment, I really support what Jeff Haynes is saying is that, you know, I wish that, but well, I don't wish that, but budgets are not under our control. And in some aspects, we shouldn't even take that into consideration. It's really about the zoning. Um, and I think that's way too many floors. Um, the other concern I have is about neighborhood input. Um, if Ron, who lives too, literally 200 feet away and actually has had, I mean, interest in downtown development for as long as I've known him and is truly one of our experts, the input from the neighborhood really bothers me. Um, the other thing that really is at the heart of this, and I find this to be one of the hardest cases we've ever, we've actually ever heard. And that's because no matter how I look at it, it's got conflicting goals and they actually are competing goals. And that's an inescapable part of working in a planning world. And we can't prevent those dilemmas, but we can learn from research, particularly about organizational conflicting goals. That is, we often are tempted to pick one side or the other instead of really encouraging people to sit down and really come up with something that is closer to a compromise um, and creatively solve this dilemma. Because I, I, nothing in me can go against what our historic advocates and what our historic commission says, but there's nothing, I can go, there's no real ground for not approving this. And so I really could support a deferral and a lot of work to come up and try to address some of the concerns we have. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, Commissioner Tibbs, you want to go next? Yes. Um, I think maybe maybe first I just want to ask a couple of questions to uh, Tim, if he if you would uh, you could allow him to speak, um, Chairman. Yeah, let's get him unmuted, Sean. Is he still he unmuted? Give us just a second, Chair, and he's good to go. Okay. Okay. Uh, Tim, um, so I wanted to get something. Um, so it is on. Right now, it is on the National Register. Uh, that means, so could you describe the changes that would happen on the interior that would jeopardize that? Could you could you address that first? Uh, sure, thank you. Uh, it's the lobby. You know, when that building was built, really the only true public space was that grand lobby. So by adding those two large columns, which are needed to support the 14 stories above, and by, again, inserting that stair into the space, it it transforms it greatly. And uh, so that is something that would not meet the Secretary of Interior standards, which we're required to follow by state law metro ordinance. So, um, so basically, after this is done, it will... It will not comply, and, and I know not just the lobby, but is it any way it'll still comply? I, I don't, that's not saying it right, but you know what I mean? Like, uh, will it go off the register completely at that point? Well, it will no longer meet the criteria. There'll have to be a move by the public or someone at THC to look at the property again, but it no longer leave meets the criteria and it will eventually be removed once they evaluate it again. And I do have a letter from Patrick McIntyre, the executive director of the Tennessee Historical Commission saying that. Uh, I think he tried to get it in, but I don't believe he made the deadline at three o'clock. I think it came in a little bit later. Okay. Um, and, and can you, and this might be a tough one, but when in the DTC of the core historic district, um, can you give, I mean, as far as you can go, as far as a little bit of more background on that, uh, just how, especially like, I'm going to talk about overlay kind of stuff with contributing buildings and things like that. But um, can you just, can you talk about that, you know, as far as the historical commissions, you know, uh, view maybe of that? Do you know what I'm asking? 
Uh, not exactly. Uh, can you elaborate well, just a little bit more? Yeah, I'll try to. And, and this may be something that um, planning staff might. Commissioner Tibbs, if it's a question about the downtown, I think it's more appropriate to direct that to Eric Hammer. If it's okay. a specific question about downtown, MDA, the, the Historic Zoning Commission has a role, but they don't have the same oversight responsibility. Okay. okay. Well, it's, thank you, Tim. Um, Eric, can you just describe about the core historic district, um, about the characteristics that are used to put that together in the DTC? Uh, Commissioner, I, just to clarify, I can explain um, what the, the, the sub-district in, entails, um, but in terms of the, the way that it was put together, um, I can briefly touch on that, but um, I may need to defer to um, others on the call who have more experience from that era of metro planning. Um, so the, this specific sub-district kind of is the section of the downtown core that has a lot of this really fine-grained historic fabric. Um, and the way that the standards were formulated, uh, the corners of a block basically get 10 stories. Uh, the interior, you can uh, have six stories with an additional um, uh, four stories through bonus height and you can get to 10 stories. So the idea is definitely that you have um, more height towards the corner of the block. In addition, there's also architectural standards um, that are a little bit more rigorous than you'll see in other areas of downtown, uh, including uh, areas like Lafayette, uh, Broadledge Hill, um, or Gulch, uh, Gulch South or North. Um, so they're more specific to that kind of fine grain character. Um, in terms of the manner which this subject district and the boundaries were decided on, um, I probably have to uh, leave it to more senior staff to explain that. Um, okay, well, that that's actually says d d decently what I wanted to talk about. So, um, <clears throat> first, I do want to say that I, I I don't want it to just. I appreciate the developer looking to uh, to not just to, you know to figure out a way to try to make the uh, existing building work. I, I mean, there's so many projects around Nashville that um, you know you just see these beautiful mansions that are just gone because there's nothing we can do with them at all. And there's uh, the designer thinking of a way to incorporate this into the building. I think it makes, you know, definitely applaud it. And I don't, I don't want that to go without saying because the uh, adaptive reuse using that word and the idea of it is definitely good. Um, well, I, I mean, I just wish developers would think about that as at least one of their options all the way through it. Um, I, I, my, my biggest problem is the height, uh, and that's kind of always been my issue. And, and the reason why I get back to the core historic district, you know, is it's, it's like, well, if this building, I guess where I thought it was, you know, it was probably one of the reasons why this district was made, and I'm, I'm assuming, so maybe I can be corrected later, but I'm assuming that because of this building, that is one of the reasons why this was part of a core historic district. And if, you know, to, um, to, to completely, you know, it was on the National Register, which is, you know, something that, you know, we should be really excited about within itself. And, you know, all the things that we're doing already to take away from it, it, it just seems like it's just disappointing that, you know, our historic districts are just kind of overlooked just because we don't have the tool of an overlay to protect it. Um, and I and also I want to pause and say I do appreciate the easement that they're looking to do as far as the facade easement as well. So this is not like like this is horrible get you know this is terrible I, I i don't want to say that at all i really appreciate the effort i i feel that all we you know it's, you know you, the bonus height was given and then now an extra bonus height is given it and now the bonus height is even higher than the corner you know it's like taller than the stallman building so it's you know it's we're you know we've they've it's like we've given an inch. Okay, you take the inch. We're giving you a foot. Okay, you take the foot. Okay, it's just like more and more and more. And and I, under, you know, I understand, you know, the the financial implications. And but as far as just what we have to work with, I feel like that it should be it should be lower than a stallman. I mean, at least it should have those type of the regular, you know, of the requirements to 
not be the tallest building uh, in the block. I mean, and I, I'm on cell phone, so I may have got my heights wrong, but um, I'm not sure if it's taller than the Hotel Indigo across the street. Eric? Eric, can you check on the height um, associated with the hotel Indigo? Um, and then while you're doing that, I think Commissioner Tibbs, I mean, again, since we're in a decision-making role, if you have specific questions about the height, how did the applicant consider a lower height, I would direct that question to the applicant and ask, you know, just so that we are creating a record of the discussion. Okay. I'm still kind of rambling a little bit, but um, I, I think I wrote down the Hotel Indigo was 180 feet. That that would be correct, Commissioner. Both uh, Hotel Indigo and the Stallman building are approximately 180 feet. Um, the, okay. the difference is the stories and the floor-to-floor -floor height of them. So, and so this building would be taller than both of those? That would be correct at around 196 feet. Okay, that's what I thought too. So that was, that's the other thing is like we're now it's now it's the tallest building in the area, even Hotel Indigo, which is across the street. So I, the, I wanted to just kind of get that out first. That is my, you know, most, you know, part that bothers me the most about it. And, you know, it's kind of like I understand the, the statement perfect enemy of good, but uh, I also, you know, you know why is it always a story building? Is they have to take the take the heat? You know, take uh, just take the punch for everything, everything. So, anyway, um, so yeah, uh, I will go with what you said, Lucy. Maybe if I could talk to the uh, applicant about height and uh, the opportunity to get it lower than the Stallman building. John, if you'll get the applicant, is the applicant unmuted? Chair, you should have the applicants able to speak. Thank you very Go much. Ahead. Can you hear me? Uh, yes, Commissioner Tibbs, we ask your question for the applicant. Yes, uh, thank you for that question. And in short, I wanted to sort of paraphrase and give you a snapshot that, that we're actually two years into this process. And um, being specialists in adaptive reuse and all those shareholder things that I talked to you about, we met early on um, with representatives from Tim's office on site. Uh, Tim was supposed to be at the meeting, but got delayed at another meeting. But he's, you know, the, the historic folks have been involved from the very beginning, getting previews of all the, the imagery and everything else. And to be very clear, the building started out over 21 stories high because you just, you know, the developers do like us is you, you take the projected cost of construction acquisition, and then you, you run it through a set of metrics and it tells you what it has to come out at. So at least in space. From there, you do a lot of studies in terms of what you, which use generates the most money, office or hotel. In Nashville, it's hotel. We commissioned um, a $40,000 hotel study on rack rates. So I don't want anyone to feel like the greedy developers are here and we just have to have 17. No, it, it was in excess of 21 and, and staff, Metro staff, um, it, it fairly but firmly said that will never happen. We're not going to look at it. It's not an option. So we started whittling it away. And to that end, we were balancing what, what Ms. Ziegler had told us that Historic would like to see on the inside, which was more than just a lobby, right? Yeah, it is, it is a lobby, but there's also a grand um, mezzanine that surrounds it. And then I asked very specifically, what would you prefer to see, Tim and Robin? Um, does the inside need to blend with what it would have been historically, or do you want it desperately different so that people can walk in and tell the difference? And they sort of designed that for us. So when it's all said and done, just that restorative effort is pushing $5 million. And you have to add that on top of everything else and you back into how many stories it takes and then you whittle it down. And, and us being a developer that's the end user and historians at our core, as evidenced by our other projects, we have different drivers than everyone else. So not only did we barely get it to 17, I don't know that anyone else would even get it close because they have a need for a return on investment that we don't have. I would be happy tonight to have you amend the requirements that have set up by staff to say that we cannot be higher 
than the Stallman or the Indigo and the feats, the feat that was noted. Um, because where we're at now, we're several hundred thousand dollars in, in design work, and it's not in its completed stage. But if that's the driver, you know, instead of having 10 foot ceilings in each of the rooms, maybe they become eight and a half or nines. So we can accomplish what we need to in terms of generating the revenue needed to restore the property and make it financially viable, which as a past elected official for 12 years, I know that's not part of the equation in terms of what we say, but it's a it's a reality in terms of Nashville specifically because the building's at risk. And it's not that I'm going to tear it down because we're preservationists, but outsiders outside of Nashville, people that don't live here like we do, have different drivers. So just to be clear, I worked very closely with Tim and Robin all the way through lots of conversations, lots of imagery, lots of feedback. And I understand that we have a phys, you know, literally a disconnect in terms of they simply can't support something that pulls a building off of the registry. They simply can't support um, penetrating the building to support the upper stories. And, and I understand that I'd probably be in their same shoes if I were still a director. With that said, um, I think the overarching issue is we want to preserve the building. And if we stand firm on words, then we're going to potentially lose an asset. This is where adaptive reuse has to have everyone come to the middle and not let perfect get in the way of good and not, not hang fast and, and hard on words and, and kind of step back and look and, and ask ourselves, when we're standing on the sidewalk admiring the beautiful facade and the ADA compliance in this beautiful lobby, and since we're in the museum business, the mini interactive museum that we design with uh, Historic Nashville that tells the story of, of Banker's Alley and Printer's Alley and, and our banking history here in Nashville, um, what a great story it would be to energize that lobby again and the mezzanine above and all the beautiful accoutrements on the ceiling. I mean, this is a beautiful structure, but to do that, it, it's not, there's no special sauce here other than you've got a developer that doesn't have the same return on investment requirements. We do this and we're really good at it. We operate in downtown Nashville and I can tell you cap it to be lower than the other buildings and we'll work that out with each floor incrementally, but we can't go too much further financially or it becomes not viable. Okay, thank you very much. Mr. Tibbs, you got another, any more questions for the developer? No, I don't, thank you. Okay, thank you for the applicant. Um, now we are on to Commissioner Black. Oh, hold on, Commissioner Tibbs, are you finished, or are you um, you need do you have any more questions? Um, I think I have all the information, um, but and I I, I do appreciate the uh, developer's um, passion. Okay, excellent. And Commissioner Blackshear. I'm not um, voting on this one, Chairman. Oh, that's right. I'm sorry. I apologize. You're abstaining on this one. Um, and so that, uh, I think, um, I usually don't make a lot of uh, comments um, during the commission meetings, but I used to, um, but I, I like to hear every commissioner has to say, and I, I think this has been a really great discussion, one of the more in-depth discussions we've had in a long time. And I think everybody had um, extremely valid points. Um, you know, personally, uh, I'm, I was a little concerned with the height um, as well. Um, but I also, um, out of, uh, I've, I've been involved in, in hotel developments in the past. Um, I no longer work for the, the hotel association, so I, I can vote on this and I have no, no um, I don't, I'm not involved in this particular hotel, but hotels are, are very expensive to build. Uh, I understand um, how you look at a hotel project and you look at the market and you have a hotel study done. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm actually shocked that they can do it um, for 17 stories, only 17 stories. And so I, I'm, I am um, shocked that they're able to do that. And I, 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 I've seen their work before and think they do great work. I also love the historic buildings in Nashville. I love this historic building. I, I think we're at great risk of, of losing it, if not by this project, by another project. They'll end up selling the building if they can't make a viable project out of it. And 
um, I, I believe that um, I, I kind of like the idea. Maybe we 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 put a um, another condition in there that that the the height can't go over um, the same height as the Stallman building, and um, I think. Eric, what what is the height of, of the Stallman building? Remind me. The height of the Stallman building is uh, 180, 180 feet, uh, based on the staff report. One hundred eighty feet. So, I mean, the, if the, if the developer is willing to 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 do that and and reduce the amount of each floor, I think that's a that's a pretty good compromise. And I try to be a realist in, in these situations and I, I feel like this is a really great project. Um, I can see it in my mind and um, I, I think that if we could um, have um, the, the two conditions for me, whoever makes the motion, one would be to limit to a total height of 180 feet and potentially say to encourage all of the historical um, as much as possible, all the historical context in the building inside and work with the historic commission to do that. That's my comments. I, I feel like I'm going to end up supporting the project if we can put those um, things into the conditions. Um, uh, Mr. So, Mr. Uh, yes. Mr. Chair, if I could amend um, what I said mentioned previously to get the most specific, um, the height to the top of the mechanical penthouse is 176 feet. The height to the last occupied floor roof is 160 feet. Okay. Well, we'll have to. I, I, I'm not. That might be a question for for the developer. Um, so it's 170. Eric, can you repeat what you just said? I'm writing it down. Absolutely. It's 176 to the top of the mechanical penthouse. I actually believe that if we go back in the slideshow, it may show a representation of that earlier on. Yeah. And it's a 160 to the, the top floor or the roof of the top floor. But if we could go back, I think the visual representation may be best. This will, Eric, you could all right there. Okay, thank you, sir. So I, I guess I, I need to, I, Director, I think it would, it would be, I think we need to ask the developer how, what his intention was with the statement that the same height as the Stallman building. I think, I think that would be appropriate. That would be helpful. Okay, let's, uh, Sean, if you would get the developer on the line one more time. And then I, I see lots of hands, so I'm going to get to the vice chair and the council lady and Mina after I get a clarification on what he's willing to do. And Thank you. Chair, you have the developers able to speak. All Thank right. You. So, what what is the maximum height that minimum height that you're willing to go? You, 160 feet or 176 feet at the top of them to the mechanical. And it's a fair question. Um, we would actually need to stick to the 176 to be able to hopefully maybe squeeze out six to 10 inches from each of the 16 floors to bring it down enough. Um, we've not put a lot of money into those studies because we've been shrinking the building to this point. But what happens in that headspace in commercial buildings, and I think you said from your background, you know, it's where we run all of the mechanicals for air conditioning, heating, plumbing. So that can only get so small and you don't want a room that feels like you're in um, a travel trailer. So I think if we could, if we can hear the commission's point of not wanting to be taller than Indigo and not wanting to be taller than Stallman, we can definitely shoot to bring it in at Stallman height and just shrink the rooms a bit more because what that accomplishes is the visual issues that, that seem to be part of the question, um, but it doesn't reduce our actual key count because in hotels, if you fall anywhere below 100, you're done, you're not gonna get a great operator and a reservation system, which makes it not viable. 
Um, so you really need to be at the 120-ish range or more. And we're right at that breaking point now as well with this because the floor plates being so small. So if we could have staff amend their their restrictions to 176 feet, I will spend more money with Patrick at Gresham to do some more studies and see if we can squeeze it out. Okay, thank you, I appreciate that. All right, so uh, we have hands up, uh, Vice Chair. You're first. You have more discussion. I actually think that the course of this discussion, I left my hand up just because, but I think the course of this discussion, and particularly what you just went through with the um, possibility of a different height increase or a height um, requirement, um, addressed my concerns. So I'm actually good. Thanks. Okay. And we have Councilor Murphy. You have your hand up. Thank you, Chair. I wanted yep. to just bring up, uh, I, well, let me ask two quick questions before I bring up one point that I missed in my earlier comments. Um, in the downtown code, obviously I'm not as familiar with it as I am with my own um, uh, community areas and plans, but you know, a lot of times when going before other commissions and boards, we talk about variances, whether it be height or, or setbacks and things, and they're based on hardships. Is there any like I, hardships considered in the downtown code that would give bonuses for example like what i'm thinking is that this is a small parcel it is and it it doesn't look to be the same size or shape as other parcels um or buildings in in the block overview shown to us is that something that is remotely in the downtown code or not at all eric can you speak to the bonus height program i think we might be using different vocabulary. I want to make sure, talk about bonus height and then see if that answers the councilwoman's question. Absolutely, I can explain about uh, bonus height. Overall height, um, the overall height modification process is a little bit different, uh, but generally speaking, um, there are uh, programs available through the bonus height program to allow uh, more height on a site um, based on trade-offs with specific public benefits. Um, in, in terms of the hardship, particularly on the site, um, there's no language in there based on that. Um, it's not like a it's not like a variance process per se. Um, if you're referring to the overall height modification process, the one we're we're looking at right now, um, there are three criteria that I listed in the the presentation that we use. Um, in all those three, um, uh, that that's been the guidance that we have used to produce our recommendation. Okay, thank you. I just wanted to make sure that I wasn't missing something or there was if there was any other application we could apply here. Um, one other question uh, before I say a comment uh, briefly is, um, is there the ability to, is there a chance that this hotel could be turned over to be all short-term rentals? I actually don't know the answer to that. Uh, I don't know, Eric, can you address that from a use perspective? Um, let me see if I can address that. This is Joni. Um, Short-term rentals are allowed in the downtown code and in this use area. So uh, you are correct that the building could be short-term rentals. Though I don't think that's the aim of the applicant. Short-term rentals are not limited in the downtown code. Okay. Um, I'm not sure if I want to necessarily go down that route just because, uh, you know, we we limit short-term rentals in a lot of places and downtown is a neighborhood too but but again not sure if i wanted to continue down that road but one point i wanted to make that i missed in my earlier comments is something that i hear at historical all the time when because i have what like maybe four or five uh historic conservation overlays in my district when we go before historic and reviewing their their guidelines a lot of times they talk about they don't want faux historic they don't want um you know, uh, uh, a house uh, coming into the neighborhood that just tries to to look like the other ones, but just so obviously misses it because it's all, everything's new, right? And I think that one of the things that I liked about this, um, this is that they are keeping the historic part and that they aren't trying to make the, the top new hotel look historic or, or attempt to look historic. Um, and I think that just the contrast there, even 
like draws your attention to the the historic part of the building and so i think that was left out i, I left out for one reason or another by historic when talking about this but i think that's something that i hear all the time from them is that they don't want buildings to be new and try to look like they are old and and again on this one where we have an opportunity to save and and i don't like saying force but but basically a condition is forcing the 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 building to become public like this i just think it's an opportunity that we would be sorry if we missed out on it and and i like um that greg went through the exercise of figuring out the that height and i would really support that condition added to this and i do wish that there had been some other historic input on what other things need to be saved but i think the height is is a really good condition that the chair brought up thank you thank you Councilor. we have uh commissioner johnson you have your hand up in the icon thank you chair uh yeah i really do appreciate uh robust uh conversation and a question and response from uh the applicant. Yeah, I raised my hand because it was such a difficult decision uh, for applicant because it was, you know, uh, height and design and it seems like at the, you know, the matter of second we are asking is it feasible uh, or doable to reduce the height and at the same time, you know, uh, several commissioners are uh, uh, really concerned about the height. So so I was wondering at that point uh, when I raised the hand, if I should kind of put a little pause and, and then defer and come up uh, to the uh, you know decision. But if everybody's, you know, got answered and comfortable and moving into one way or the other, uh, uh, you know, I, I'm not moving and making any motion to defer, I just, just wanted to, kind of, you know, sometimes it's better to kind of put the pause and then think about really good, you know, uh, what would be the best solution and best result outcome. So just wanted to kind of thought it was the, you know, right decision to just uh, decide, uh, you know, height at the matter of the second. Yeah, th thank you, Commissioner. You know, my personal thought is, you know, the developer, I, a lot of times developers could get really frustrated. We have a hometown um, person that uh, I, I really want to try to help. We obviously have some concern by all of us about the height. And so I think, you know, my it seems like this is potentially, <laughs> you know, the, the best compromise. And I think it, it even puts a little hardship on the developer, which, I mean, I... I totally get it, but I understand that. And, and you know, sometimes we have to, um, um, that's why we we have, this is a public hearing, right? And that's why we have discussion and, and ask questions of both the developer, the historical commission, our staff. Um, and that's why we have all the commissioners that have a various background. And so I think the discussion has been good. Um, you know, I, it's really up to the commission whether or not we we defer but I, I feel like personally as the chairman that we we're in a good spot um <laughs> i'm not much sure i'm not sure there's commissioners willing to go over the height of the stallman building to be frank and the developer is right on that limit of not being able to work it out feasibly with keeping the historical features of the building and so i feel like um this might i think it's probably the best compromise we can get out of this. And so I, uh, we're on discussion, uh, Commissioner Simps. You have your hand up. Yes, sir. Um, I guess just as a place of trying to make us meet somewhere better in the middle, um, if we were to ask Historic to have more input into the design elements, they may not be willing to, but I would like to see the historic commission knowing that we are all likely to pass this with some height restrictions, if that would be something he would be willing to do. I mean, in the motion, I think we can encourage it, but I don't think we can mandate that to happen, Commissioner Sims. 
Yeah, I didn't know if we needed to ask Tim now or just go ahead and encourage it. I don't, I'm not sure what's the proper, but I just. Commissioner, Commissioner, Thank you, Commissioner Tim, Tim, this is. Yeah, sorry. This is Quine Pool for Mitchell Legal. And, and I just wanted to jump, I'm a, I'm a little bit leery of mandating the input of historic. I, I think it can be encouraged, but we, we also just have to keep in mind that you know, he is a Metro public employee and there are certain restrictions with public employees working directly on private development. Yes. Um, so th that, that's my own, that would be my concern with, with sort of like a mandate that they have yes. direct input um, in, in a particular type of manner. And I think the idea is part of um, the conditions we want to encourage that or as part of our comments back to council. We can go to cancel on this a bit back to yeah. historic. So, I, I think it, it, it's clear that we want the historical commission to to have um, engagement in the project. But I don't like like our attorney said. I don't think we can mandate that. I think it's make more that of a record. I just wanted on the record that we really we would really love to that's, see somehow participate in that. That's a good good point, Commissioner. Very good point. Any other discussion? Uh, if you'll raise your hands in the, in the app or verbally state you'd like to discuss. Seeing none, we will need a motion. Vice Chair, do you want to make a motion? Or yeah. uh, I'm yeah, putting no. you on the, on the spot. Well, no, I mean, I am. I'm just pondering the deferral thing and wondering if we should ask the applicant if they want a, two, a one meeting deferral to work out this height thing before we make it a condition. I, I think that's very valid. Let's let's get them on the on the phone and 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 um, Sean, if you'll get the developer on the line again, the applicant. Hello, I'm back. So Hello. My, so yeah, honestly, it, it it would be my preference, obviously, amongst all things else, that we could place a condition that we not be higher than Stallman and allow the planning staff. Um, who have been firm but fair to this point to make sure that we don't exceed that. Um, the deferrals, the economy is strange in Nashville now and the carry cost on this building over the last couple of years and the engineering costs. And I know we don't think about money, but unfortunately I have to because it's that important in terms of timing because the economy may change direction and we have to get this entitled financed and start construction. So to the degree that we would let staff make sure that it didn't exceed the 176 feet that the stallman is we'll make it work or we won't and then none of us have to worry about it but one way or the other we're committed to it as the hometown guys that that love old buildings in some crazy way um we're going to give it the old college try and and see what happens thank you sir okay. appreciate it well, in, in light of that, um, I may need some help with the condition. So the two, I'm, I'm ready to make a motion. The two conditions, that one is that we are not, uh, the height should not exceed the height of the Stallman building. And there was one, a second a second condition someone wanted. Well, the, it, it, it would be just to encourage the historical commission to work with planning staff and the developer on the historical features of the building. I, as our attorney said, I don't think that we can mandate That's, that, but we can encourage it. Okay. So I will make a motion that we approve staff's recommendation with the, addi the addition of the condition that the height should not exceed that of the, the Stallman building. Um, Which is 176 feet. 176 feet. And we would encourage uh, Metro Historic Commission to work together with planning and the applicant to see um, what else can be done to preserve the historic features of the building. That's a proper motion. Is there a second? Council Lady Murphy, would you like to second? Yes, I'll second the motion. It's a proper second. Any other discussion? Commissioner Sims, you have your hand up, but I'm, I'm assuming you've already discussed. Or, oh, it's down, good, okay. Any other discussion? If you'll raise your hand or verbally say you'd like to discuss. Seeing none, we are ready to vote with the condition stated by the vice chair and the encouragement of working with the historical commission and commissioner blackshear is abstaining vice chair far we're on the roll behaving. call but 
<laughs> yeah, no. Sorry, we are on the roll call, but yeah, yeah I couldn't get my mute to un to undo. Uh, I approve. I. Commissioner Gobble. Aye. Commissioner Haynes. Aye. Commissioner Johnson. Aye. Commissioner Lawson. Commissioner. Aye. Councilor Murphy. Aye. Commissioner Sims. Aye. Commissioner Tibbs. Aye. The chair votes aye, nine ayes, uh, one abstention, and it passes with the new condition. With the new condition. Now I am going to ask again. <laughs> do the commissioners uh, speak up? Forever hold your peace, Vice Chair. Do you, do we want to take a five minute break, or or is everybody want to want to? Um, move forward how about we well let's ask uh, the vice chair do you want me to let's let's ask the committee raise your hand if you um want to take a break in your your icon hands oh there's a couple okay so let's do this how about um vice chair why don't we take a quick five minute break and um so everyone can um gain their senses i don't think we have a a lot uh, left in the meeting at least not unreasonable so Director, are you okay with that? Uh, yes, she said. Absolutely. Break. Okay, so. Uh, uh, Chairman we'll Atkins, I, five. Chairman yeah. Atkins, I would just let you know I have to um, get off the call now, but um, you guys have fun the rest of the night. Thank you, Commissioner Tibbs. We appreciate your presence and your knowledge on historical issues. It means a lot to us. So, <laughs> All right. Have you. a good one. Y'all take care. And I do want to thank. Um, Thank you. All right. I, want, I do want to thank Director Walker for being on the call and, and being part of it. I really appreciate that. I know these are, he's extremely passionate about what he does and um, I appreciate that. So let's take a quick five minute break. It's um, 746. So we'll just say um, like around um, 752, 750. How about 755? We'll, we'll, we'll get back going at 755. So everybody's We'll go on break. See you at 7.55. Nobody, don't log off or anything. Everybody stay on the call, though. Just mute your lines. Thank you.
All right, so uh, let's see if everybody's uh, back. And uh, I, I want to, um, I said 7.55, so we got another minute. But uh, a reminder, everybody make sure you're on mute. Uh, and then I know it's kind of tough to go on and off mute, but make sure everybody, commissioners, make sure uh, everybody's on mute. And then... It is now 7.55, so we will get going again, we'll resume the Planning Commission meeting, and we are on. Director, are you there? I want to make sure hey, you're there. Hey, uh, Chairman, this is Quan yes. from Legal. Do we want to just establish that everybody else made it back before getting yes, started? Yes, we do. Why don't we do a, a roll call vote to make it official on the phone? How about that, Quan? Is that okay? Sounds perfect. Okay, so we're we're going to do just a roll call just to reestablish uh, that uh, you are back on the call. So, Commissioner Blackshear, are you present? Here. Vice Chair Farr. Here. Commissioner Gobble. Here. Commissioner Haynes. We'll come, Commissioner Haynes. We'll come back to Commissioner Haynes. Commissioner Johnson. Yes, sir, I'm here. Commissioner Lawson. Here. Council Lady Murphy. Here. Commissioner Sims. Here. And Commissioner Tibbs is no longer with us on the call. And Commissioner Haynes. He'll be back shortly, so we'll get Commissioner Haynes back on the line in a minute. All right, we'll give him just one more minute. Uh, yeah. Chairman, this is Lucy. I'm sorry, I'm working with Commissioner Haynes, who was switching technologies. These are words oh, okay. we use. These are words we use these days. It's like he's switching technologies. Um, so if you could just give us one moment. Um, no problem. We're not. Okay. Good. Director, do we have Commissioner Haynes yet? We do not. Sean at uh, Recall Center, uh, are you there? Uh, I just sent you Commissioner Haynes's um, telephone number. He's having a bit of trouble connecting. What can we do to support him? Uh, Lucy, this is Sean at the Call Center. We are in the process of trying to reach out to him. Hang on just a minute. Thank you. And commissioners, while we're waiting, I just want to say thank you for um, your service on the commission. It is much greatly appreciated. And um, we'll get 
momentarily get Commissioner Haynes on the phone. Good thing is, is we do have quorum. Chair, this is Sean at the call center. Um, we have located Commissioner Haynes in the um, attendee list, so you might check in with him verbally to make sure that you can hear him and he can hear you. Okay, we'll do. <laughs> Commissioner Haynes, can you hear us? Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, yes. You're getting a pink slip for your technology use tonight. <laughs> I, I deserve one. Thank you. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just joking. Okay, so we are now on to, we have established the roll call of the commissioners that are present. We are item, we're on item number, we have two items left. We have items number 24 and 25 uh, to hear for public hearing. So we are on item number 24. And we also have the councilwoman on the line. We always... Um, We'll do the, the council uh, lady last, and, and she, uh, I believe she's online. We appreciate uh, Council Lady Virtue for joining us. And um, so we are on item 24. Jason, I believe, is the presenter, Mr. Swaggart. And Chairman, this is Sean again. I just want to let you know that Jason is also down in the attendee list, but he is unmuted and can address you. Um, Jason, you will have to use the mute on your phone to control mute because otherwise we have to turn you on and off manually. So um, thank you. Carry on. Wait, I'm oh, sorry. So sorry to interrupt. I definitely feel like this is a, a mess. Um, uh, Commissioner uh, Sims just lost her connection as well. Um, I see her. Can we just do a quick check to see if she's... A, no, she just disappeared. Uh, do you mind giving her a moment just to make sure that the commissioners hear all the information? I'm sorry. Yep, no, we need to... Sean, will you try to get... Mr. Sims back on the line and we'll give, give her a moment. Sorry, commissioners about this, but we'll, we, everybody's got to hear it. Presentation. We'll give a few minutes. We're working on it, Chairman, I'm sorry. All right, we're, we're gonna do a few more minutes. Um, so I'm being told Commissioner Sims has lost power, so I'm wondering, okay, give me just, I'm sorry, give me just one moment. She's rebooting now. Okay. We'll wait. Do we still have Commissioner Haynes on the lines? Yes, you do. All right, excellent.
Chairman, it sounds like a large chunk of the city is having power problems, according to ITS. Um, so I, I wonder if we ought to go ahead and proceed. Um, I'm, um, yeah, Sean? If, yeah. If she joins back up, she can hear the next case. Okay. okay. I think we need to go ahead and proceed. Okay, thank you. It's getting it's thank getting late and I don't want to lose quorum with other commissioners falling off. So okay. thank you. Chair, we will we'll keep troubleshooting with uh Commissioner Sims behind the scenes. We're not really sure how much how many people are affected, but we did get some reports that, that various places were having outages. So we'll keep working with her. Oh, I see she's rejoined. We may be in good shape. Commissioner Sims, are you can you hear us? You, you have to unmute yourself, Commissioner. Yes, I'm sorry. I think Ron and I both had power failures. Our, our, my, my, the whole light, everything over here actually went blank. My website, my lights, everything. So I'm back on. Yeah. No, that's happened to me too. It's part of the deal. So thank you. All right, we're back on. Item number 24, Mr. Swagger, let's do this. Okay, uh, Lisa, you can go ahead and go to the next slide. This is item 24. This is a request to revise the preliminary plan and for final site plan approval for phase three of Canyon Ridge to permit 124 multifamily units. Next slide. The subject site, which is highlighted in orange. Oh, I'm sorry. This item was deferred from your August 27th meeting. There was no public hearing. Next slide. Subject site, which is highlighted in orange, is a portion of a larger plan unit development, which is outlined in red. The subject site is approximately 22 acres and is located at the northwest corner of Edge of Lake Drive and Pebble Creek Drive. Next slide. Staff is recommending approval with conditions. Next slide. This is the council approved plan. The subject site is outlined in red and is currently approved for 142 multifamily units. Next slide. There was a recent request for a periodic review for the subject section of the development on the April 23rd meeting of this year. The commission determined that the development was active or is active. Next slide. This is the proposed site plan. It calls for 124 multifamily units. The site is encumbered with Steep slopes over 20% and the development footprint is outside of these areas. Ingress, egress into the site by two private drives of the Edge of Lake Drive. There are sidewalks along both Edge of Lake Drive and Pebble Creek Drive. Some sections of the sidewalk are in need of repair and the section along the site boundary will be repaired with the development of the project. Next slide. The zoning code allows the planning commission to approve minor modifications when certain conditions are met. These requirements are outlined in the staff report. This slide provides staff findings for each condition outlined in the report. In short, the request meets all the standards and the proposed plan is consistent with the council approved plan. Also, the minor changes in the proposed layout reduce the overall footprint, decreasing the amount of grading necessary to develop the site. In conclusion, staff is recommending that the commission approve the request with conditions. Thank you, sir. Appreciate that. We'll open this item for public hearing. Is the Sean is the applicant on the line? Chair, we do have representatives from the of the applicants, um, and they are unmuted and should be able to address the commission. All right. Good uh, Welcome, and we appreciate you'll have 10 minutes to speak, and you can save two minutes of the 10 for rebuttal. Um, please state your name and your address, and you may begin. Good evening. Um, my name is Kevin Estes, 2925 Berry Hill Drive, Nashville, Tennessee, 37204. I am uh, the property owner and developer of this property. I'm with both Land Solutions and Green Trails. We have um, worked with staff and once again as staff said we've reduced the density of this property we've um, removed the development from the steep slopes we minimized the grading and we provided a much larger area of open space than was originally provided with the approved pod i have had one cons one conversation with um, council member virtue 
At that time, I told her I would be willing to defer for a time. I, we had a misunderstanding that it would be into after COVID, but I did send an email and, and copy the council member and members of this um, council staff, I believe, as well as whoever she had um, emailed me with, I replied all to, stating that we would go ahead and give this an additional deferral of another four weeks till this meeting. I've been open to having Zoom meetings, um, and I've tried to keep open an email communication, but as I've said, I've had um, one email and one conversation with council member Virtra on this property. I would ask that um, this be proved. We've owned this property for a while. We've had these plans in for review and for approval for about six months. Um, I understand money is not an issue to the commission, but we've um, been on hold for this through almost all of the good <laughs> dry season, which has hurt us tremendously. And we have followed all the rules and would just ask for approval and I will hold my time. Thank you. Thank you and you'll have two minutes for rebuttal. We appreciate you joining us tonight. We are now ready to take calls from the members of the public who wish to call in. Your screen should now show in the call in number so please call in now. You don't need to wait uh, because you'll be, uh, for others to speak, you need to call in because we'll place you in a queue. As a reminder, only call on this particular case that you're interested in speaking on. When you begin your testimony, please um, state your name, address, and whether you support or, oppo or oppose the item. We're not able to display the timer, as I've said earlier. This is a reminder that Sean will give you a 30 minute, uh, 30 minute, 30 second, warning of 30 seconds left in your speech and she will also tell you when um, you've ran out of time um, also uh, the council lady is on the call with us uh, so after the rebuttal we will hear from the the council lady i just want to make sure she knows that that we uh, definitely uh, will make sure that she has plenty of time and to speak last after everyone else has spoken so we need to check with Lisa on emails while we get people callers in the queue. Lisa, any emails come in on this project, this item? No, Chairman. We did not receive any email communications. Okay, thank you, Lisa. Appreciate that report. Sean, do we have any callers for this particular item? Chairman, we do not currently have any callers in the queue, so we'll take a brief pause and then I'll check back in. Okay, thank you. Sean, do we have any callers? Chair, we do not have any callers for this item. All right. Well, uh, Mr. Applicant, I'm assuming you, you don't want to do a two-minute rebuttal, and then we'll have the council member speak. Is that correct? The applicant, would you like to speak, say anything else? or, um, And then the council member will speak. Uh, no, thank you, Chairman. I, I have nothing else to say. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Appreciate it. Council Lady Virtue, you're recognized. Thank you so much, uh, Commissioners. Uh, my name is Councilwoman Taneka Virtue. I reside at 901 Split Oak Drive. That's Antioch, Tennessee, 37013. I'm speaking on the agenda, agenda item 123-83P-001. Um, that's the Canyon Ridge uh, Phase 3, uh, the revision and, and final plan. I am speaking simply not for or against but to be on the record representing the district uh, constituents of District 28, um, that we continue to allow development without infrastructure, educational capacity, and public safety. 
In this same area in 2005, a family in our community was shaken and it wouldn't be, it wouldn't be the last. For many years, neighbors have been requesting smart, sustainable de development for the area, but it remains to fall on deaf ears. We are beyond requesting infrastructure, uh, better schools for the community, and public safety. It's beyond a planning matter now. We are evolving uh, into a matter of in impeding on a community civil rights. There remains to be a disconnect in departmental decisions and the planning commission we continue to allow the creation of failing communities. No only the area is not adequately staffed, both police and fire, as the incident we had two days ago with the fire complex at Dover Glen Apartments. No only that schools are over capacity, no only that infrastructure has not kept pace with the growth, and that's not on the developer. I want to thank the commissioners and again, Mr. Estes for his time um, and patience in meeting uh, the demands uh, for, the, for, uh, for the community uh, and being gracious enough um, as it relates to a deferral. And again, I'm speaking to be on public record that as a city, we knowingly continue to allow development to occur in certain communities where we know there is an adequate police and fire, where we know that our educational system is already stretched beyond capacity, and we know the infrastructure as well. So that's all I, I wanted to say, commissioners. Thank you uh, for allowing me to speak, and y'all have a great evening. Thank you, Councilor. I appreciate you joining us. Seeing no one else wishes to speak, I declare the public hearing closed. Um, and since uh, this uh, item, let's try this with, with the commissioners, um, since there was no opposition. Um, if the commissioners, if is there any discussion? And if you'll raise your hands in the, um, if you raise your icon hand, and we will start off with Commissioner Blackshear. You recognize. Thanks, Chairman. Um, uh, Council Member Vercher, um, she made some great points in um, advocating for the district, and it's something that we've heard not just from her district, but from other districts about just the infrastructure. And she added. Um, another piece to the discussion regarding um, just public safety and police and fire. And I would like to ask staff, particularly about the public safety aspect of it. I mean, what, what are the implications for this development as it relates to um, police, fire, and just general public safety? And what can, um, I mean, I know that obviously we pay attention to that when we are um, looking at items, but in her larger conversation about infrastructure, um, uh, overcrowding of certain area schools, I mean, what can we do as a commission to kind of help that conversation and, uh, and improve matters in um, the metro area? Well, I just uh, first want to thank the Councilwoman Vircher for, for coming and sitting through that interesting previous case uh, and being patient with us as a commission and sharing her concerns about the community. Um, I think one thing we figured out how to do uh, well is look at new projects and impacts to new projects, but I think Councilwoman Vircher has made some Good points to me in previous discussions that um, we need to look more holistically at impacts and um, and certainly there are some decisions that we made 20 and 30 years ago, not with this project particularly, but but with others that, you know, we would do differently today. I think on the broader question that that um, that she raised regarding how we think about community needs. Um, we, we really try to use our CIB program, and I see Greg Claxton on the phone, to help match um, uh, needs that the council members express to us, but also the departments like police and fire. And um, we have a ways to go. We know with schools in particular, they, they have said publicly that this is an area that needs to be better served. And so sort of steering that ship, it's a large ship, um, I think requires a lot of due diligence um, that this council member shows. And, 
it's very hard. And I think she rightfully noted that talking about that in the context of one project um, is, is probably not fruitful, but we have to keep piecing it together. And I personally think that the budget process is, is the right place to do that. And we try to do that well through the CIB. Um, this particular project isn't a rezoning and I know that that can be very frustrating to council members because we're we're just operating within entitlements that that already exist. And so we're looking to see if this meets the previous approvals, but that doesn't get us out of looking at overall impacts. And so I appreciate her feedback and holding us to task on that point. Mr. Blackshear, yeah, th yes, thanks, Chairman. Um, yeah, that was really helpful, um, Director. Um, I mean, it's something we've heard n not just from her area, um, but from other areas as well. And I know that we've talked about it as a commission, um, but I'm I'm glad that she virtually attended today to stress that point. And um, hopefully, we and you know every other applicable metro board commission agency also um, takes up the task to, to help on these fronts. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, so let's, uh, any more discussion? If you'll raise, instead of going through each commissioner, if you'll raise your hand, your icon hand, or verbally state you'd like to speak. Anybody else? I don't see anyone else, so. We're not now ready uh, for a motion. Vice Chair, would you like to make a motion? Sure, um, I will make a motion that we have approved staff recommendation. That's a proper motion. And Commissioner Blackshear, would you like to second? Sure, I second that motion. That's a proper motion and second. Any other discussion? You'll raise your icon hand or verbally state you'd like to speak. And seeing no other discussion, we are ready for a roll call vote to approve. Commissioner Blackshear. Aye. Com Vice Chair Farr. Aye. Commissioner Gobble. Aye. Commissioner Haynes. Aye. Commissioner Johnson. Aye. Commissioner Lawson. Aye. Council Lady Murphy. Aye. Commissioner Sims. Aye. <clears throat> Chair votes aye, ayes have it, and it is adopted. We are now on to item, item 24 is adopted. We are now on to item number 25. And as our last public hearing item. I think we have Jorn. Okay, yep. Okay, item 25, you can go to the next slide. We have a request to rezone from RS 7.5 to RM4 NS, next slide. Staff recommendation is to approve, next slide. This site is located in the edge, it's on Edgemead Boulevard in Madison. The existing zoning is RS 7.5 and the surrounding land use is single family residential multifamily residential, commercial, and vacant. Next slide. The policy here is T4 maintenance and conservation. The uh, T4 maintenance policy really aims to provide these types of um, areas with opportunities for infill, particularly when offering transition between some of the less intense and more intense areas, all while still placing a real emphasis on retaining the existing character of neighborhoods. And so the proposed RM4 NS here has provided this um, sort of transition between the more intense commercial uses to the north and those higher density residential uses to the east from the less intense residential uses to the southwest. Next slide. The site is identified as transitional infill within the policy and the proposed zone change provides this transition while respecting the existing context. Therefore, staff recommends approval. Thank you. Thank you, we'll open this item for public hearing and Sean, do we have the applicant on, on the line? 
Chair, we do have representatives of the applicant and they are unmuted so they can address the commission. Excellent. Uh, welcome. Please, uh, you have 10 minutes to speak. You can save two minutes of the 10 for rebuttal. Um, please state your name and address and welcome. You can begin. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, good evening, Commissioners. Uh, my name is Shali Gapoor, uh, 9953 Low Stone Drive, Brentwood, Tennessee, 37027. Um, I am the, the one handling, hopefully, the future improvement of this property. Um, this, this rezoning request was previously on the consent agenda at the last commission meeting. Um, however, at the beginning of the uh, meeting, there was a uh, last minute phone call. And so because of that, it was deferred. Uh, the person did not leave uh, any contact information or any details regarding the call. Um, so we have not been able to address uh, any sort of concerns. Um, we reached back out to staff prior to this meeting um, there was no additional comments or details. Um, so at this point, we, we just asked to move forward and hopefully keep this rezoning going. Um, I've also got Sean DeCoster from Civil Site Design Group here in this meeting. Um, unless he's got anything to add, that is, that is all for me. Thank you. Anything else from you guys? I have nothing to add. Okay, well, we'll save uh, two minutes for rebuttal. Appreciate you guys calling in tonight. Thank you very much. Um, we are now ready to take calls from members of the, uh, from the from the public um, who wish to speak. Your screen should show in the call the call in number now. Please call in. Uh, you don't have to wait because we put you in a queue. And as a reminder, please state your you have two minutes to speak. Please state your name and address and your position, whether you're for or against. Uh, Sean will give you a 30 second warning and we'll tell you when your time is up. While we wait to get callers into the queue, Lisa, we're wondering about emails. Did we get any emails on this item? Hi, Chairman. We did not receive any email communications. Um, as the applicant mentioned, we received one call to the call center at, in advance of the last meeting. Um, and the caller asked for the item to be pulled, but we've had no further communications. Thank you, Lisa. I appreciate that. Sean, do we have any callers in the queue yet? Chair, we do have a caller and we have placed the caller in the meeting now. Perfect. Thank you very much. So welcome. To, we appreciate you joining the call. You have two minutes to speak. Please state your name and address and please begin. Thank you. My name is Karen Sloan. I live at 204 Aurora Avenue. I've been the owner and resident of this property for 21 years. I live directly in front and adjacent to where they want to put the six town homes in. We have a lot of concerns in the neighborhood. We are no, a no outlet neighborhood. So there's only one way in and out on the Gallatin Road. If you look at the map, exactly where I live, there are two curves. They're very tight. One car usually has to stop before the other one can come through, but the intersection of Aurora and Edgemead, people do not stop. When they hit those curves, nobody stops anywhere. So the outlet that they're talking about, the six townhomes to put in, it would be right in the way of if somebody rolls that corner, then people are hurt. And beyond that, we have a lot of multifamily condos in front of me, Crestbrook Meadows, there is a terrible amount of crime in this neighborhood. I've been a victim of one in 2018 when my house was hit with bullets. So we're not in favor. We're, we're not against development on that property. We just want something in line with our neighborhood. Two single family homes that, that are not tall boys, like they're building. But just yes, traffic, environment, and crime is our concern in this neighborhood. Thank you for your time and your consideration. I know you guys have been here late. Thank you very much for calling in. We appreciate your comments. Sean, do we have any other callers? Chair, there are no other callers in the queue currently, so we'll take a brief pause and then I'll check back in. Thank you. We'll, we'll, we'll give it a minute, see if anybody else calls in. Thank you, Sean.
John, do we have any other callers in the queue? Chair, we have no other callers for this item. Okay, so we are back to, we are ready for the rebuttal from the applicant. We have two minutes. You may begin. Uh, Councilman Young, and so uh, where we took a few suggestions and I heard some concerns from the from a few neighbors. Um, so one of those was that there was a tight, that, that road tightens up when you come around that curve. Um, and, you know, I addressed that and I, I extended it up to the council member that I'd look into potentially seeing if we can do some sort of improvement, uh, small roadway improvement to improve the, or widen that road right there um, in coordination with Metro Public Works. But the majority of that curve falls onto the neighboring property. Um, so, you know, that's something I told council member Zach Young that I would take a look at um, at potentially helping out where I can with that. Um, in terms of density wise, just like, you know, um, Jordan stated, we're keeping density pretty low. Um, to try to try to resemble uh, most of the most of the single family lots in that neighborhood on 0 0.2, 0 0.3 acre lots. Um, this is this will be at this point we're doing a six unit development on two acres, um, and you know, I think I think with improvement in the neighborhood, uh, development in the neighborhood, there will there will be substantial upside and uh, improvements. And so, I guess that's the end of my rebuttal. Thank you, appreciate that. And now we are ready for the council member, but I don't see the director, I did not see, or Lisa, the council member on the line. The council member on the line. Hi, sure. Chairman. Hi, Chairman, this is Lisa, he is not. Okay, did he send in a letter or anything on the project? Uh, uh, no, sir. Okay. All right, uh, seeing no one else wishing to speak, uh, we'll declare the public hearing closed and we are on to the um, discussion portion amongst commissioners. How about we, we start with um, Commissioner Haynes? Um, having grown up in this area, I think this is thoughtful and I'm gonna support staff's recommendation. All right, Commissioner Johnson. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I think, you know, looking at the staff report, uh, existing zoning uh, with the strict uh, unit count would allow maximum uh, 11 units. And, but this new proposed zoning will reduce to maximum of eight units. Considering the other side of the street already has uh, those type of similar development, uh, placement of uh, new uh, zoning, uh, RM4 and S, uh, seems to appropriate for this uh, policy-wise and, uh, you know, density-wise. And of course, you know, we are so not liking tall and skinny, but hopefully developer can uh, propose appropriate, you know, compatible to existing housing, uh, that would be uh, my hope. But since this is a, a straight zoning, you know, we cannot uh, say what kind of building or design, but as far as base zoning, I, I think I agree with the staff recommendation. Thank you, Councilor Murphy. Thank you. I've made this comment before that I am always impressed when there is a way that we've found a way to up zone something um, and have fewer units than allowed by right currently. And the traffic count uh, is a negative traffic count, it appears. So so I, I think this is an area that, that this fits in well and I support staff recommendation. Thank you, Commissioner Sims. Yes, I think this is a really thoughtful transition and a place that really kind of begs for transition. So I'm, I support the staff's recommendation. Excellent. Commissioner Black's here. Um, just echoing previous commissioners' comments, um, I would be in support of this. Um, I know that the neighbor has expressed concern about crime, which is certainly a legitimate concern. 
to have, um, since this site is currently vacant, I wonder if having something thoughtful put on um, the, the site might um, actually um, help the neighborhood, enhance the neighborhood a bit instead of um, bringing in crime. And also, I really appreciate the applicant's comments um, in response to the neighbor's concerns about um, just the, the tightness as far as cars coming through. And I, he mentioned that, you know, some of the ability to make those road improvements um, occurs on property that does not belong to him. But um, to the extent possible, I would encourage him to make those road improvements so that um, those turns can be safer for the, the neighbors. Thank you, Commissioner. Vice Chair Farr. Um, am I last on the list? No, I'm not last, am I? No, Commissioner Gobble will be last. Uh, okay, you're, well, I have, I have no that. comment. I was going to offer to make a, a motion, but I just will say I support All staff's right. recommendation. All right, let's see what Commissioner Gobble. Um, I support staff recommendation and I move approval. That's a proper motion. Is there a second? Vice Chair, you want to second that? I second that. All right, proper motion and second. Any other discussion? If you would raise your icon hand or verbally state you'd like to speak. Seeing no raising of the hands, we're ready for a roll call vote. Commissioner Blackshear. Aye. Vice Chair Farr. Vice Chair Farr. Aye. Commissioner Gobble. Aye. Commissioner Haynes. Aye. Commissioner Johnson. Aye. Commissioner Lawson. Aye. Councilor e. Murphy. Aye. Commissioner Sims. Aye. Chair votes aye. Ayes have it and staff recommendation to approve is adopted. Item 25 passes. Now we are on to last portion of other business and is there anything in from historic thank you chair uh, i don't have anything to report about knowing you know how hard historic uh commission of staff is working and you know as hard as our planning staff so i think uh probably it will come up uh in the future like uh you know, bonus height uh, program, and also on top of modification requests. And so we will have those requests knowing, you know, Nashville and knowing our uh, product and so forth. So I think I would like us, uh, our director and planning staff to think about what would be the best way for us to approach, especially you know, uh, core, historic core section uh, between third and fifth union and church. Uh, we still have a really great historical building over there, but not protected by overlay. So what would be the best way for us to preserve our unique historical character while encouraging adaptive use or redevelopment? So if we could start thinking about, and especially, you know, work with a uh, history uh, department, uh, that would be uh, excellent. Thank you. Anything from Parks? Nothing from Parks tonight. Thank you. Uh, Executive Committee, Vice Chair, we don't have anything, do we? Um, no, do you guys, I mean, maybe uh, the director will talk about this, but just sort of plans for our upcoming meetings. Do we have any developments on that front? Yeah, uh, the, the the director Kemp and I talked a little bit about it. Um, we're going to, um, I think what we would like to do is, and the director can chime in here, um, and, and I told the director to talk to the vice chair as well about this, but we would, we we're leaning towards going through October for teleconferencing for, for us and kind of see where, where we're at, or as long as, you know, the, um, the governor can do that to be safe. Um, we have talked, uh, I've talked to the director to work with, uh, I know that the Metro council is, is going to go back in person, I believe, and the director can tell you more, but, um, 
we probably don't need to be the first commission to, to go back in person. But I, honestly, the, the one thing that is most important to me is that um, the public is safe, the staff is safe, and the commissioners are safe. And when we deal with the public and the commissioners, there are a lot of um, folks that are within the CDC gu guidelines that um, are, could be at risk. And so we just want to make sure, I mean, my, I think between the vice chair and myself and the director, everyone's safety is, is the number one priority. Obviously, we want to continue to do the city's business, and it's a balance, and I think that we've taken on that challenge and have been successful with that. Um, but I do know that, that in-person meetings um, are important for transparency and that sort of thing. And so um, the plan is, is, is hopefully through October and then kind of reassess the situation and have a plan and work with the mayor's office and, and Metro to, to make sure if, when we go back in person that everyone is safe. Director, do you want to add anything to that or vice chair? Good to me. That's, that was it for me. Okay. Right. Uh, director, you want to add anything to that? Well, uh -oh. where's our, where's our director at? What happened? Director Kemp, we, I can't hear you. Vice Chair, can you hear me? Hear you. I can't hear Director Kemp. Yeah, I can't either. Because this, oh, maybe she can. Director? Chair, this is Sean at the call center. We can see her, but she may be having some audio difficulties. Okay. While she gets tries to get back online, uh, Commissioner Sims, did you have your hand up? I did. I, while we're waiting on Lucy to come back, I uh, just wanted to thank you, Chair, for really the incredibly professional job you've done in making this transition to virtual and for the thoughtfulness you put into everyone's health and safety in our city. And I appreciate the fact that we need to meet at some point personally, but again, you're putting everybody's health first. And I thank you, I probably thank you on behalf of the entire commission. Well, thank you, Commissioner Sims. That was very nice of you. Um, you know, these are unprecedented times, times that, you know, we haven't seen um, ever in my lifetime, obviously. Um, uh, so I appreciate everybody being patient. We try to be um, as fair and as transparent as, as we possibly can. And the director just texted me. She can't hear us or anything. Sean, an update with our director. Uh, Emma, can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you now. Welcome back. Oh, well, I was just going to tease uh, Council Member Murphy and say we look forward to watching the beautiful exercise that will be the council meeting next month, and we will emulate all of your best practices. And also, thank you all for your, um, just for your commitment and hard work. Well, and, and I appreciate the council too. You let us know how, how that goes. And obviously, we, in, in um, communication with um, Metro, you know, everyone at Metro to try to make it safe. But what we were saying, Director, is that the plan is right now to go through October with the teleconference meetings. You and I had discussed that, and then you discussed it with the vice chair, and that you know, that's, and then we'll have to reassess and see how like the council does it. And if there's other, we just want it to be safe. Yes. And just two quick notes on that. Um, you know, we'll be, we will be, I was teasing, but we will be watching um, council to see how they utilize the space. Um, and, but we are working with general services as well to, um, to look at our own space and uh, and others, and so they're adding safety precautions. So I think by the time we get to a place where we're talking about meeting physically in person, we'll have a number of options. Perfect. And I, I told the commissioners that you know the number one priority is obviously the safety of of everyone involved, including the public, the staff, the 
um, the commissioner. So we will keep everybody apprised uh, and I'll work with the director and the vice chair and, and make sure that, um, you know, if something moves forward, we'll be in communication, make sure everybody is comfortable because the, the one thing we don't want to do is put anyone at risk. So, all right. Um, that's the executive committee report. Um, director, anything on the director's report? Yeah, just real quick, because um, I know it's late. Um, we have a commission workshop next week where we're going to be talking about the Dickerson study, and there will be a couple of other smaller items I want to put on the table um, for the commissioners. I want you to be aware we're beginning to sketch out what the redistricting process will look like, um, which is an incredibly important um, project for the staff, and we want to make sure you're fully briefed as we think about our approach. Um, and so I hope you can uh, join us for that workshop and we're looking forward to it. And then last but not least, um, the mayor's office is going to join us next week for an informational, excuse me, not next week, at the next commission meeting for an informational inf uh, item only on the transportation plan. So there's not a vote or anything, but they, um, the mobility team there under Faye DeMassimo has asked that we um, uh, here and get a briefing on their work and be able to ask questions. So I'll be sending out some background materials to you in the next day or so. So that's my report. Thank you. Thank you. Very busy. We have lots going on. Um, Council Lady, any legislative updates? Thank you. I'll just be renewing my motion at the, the next council meeting next Tuesday that the planning staff run our council meeting so they can learn firsthand how how we work and uh, how we manage to take eight hours uh, or, or more. So, uh, no, I'm just kidding about that. Nothing to report here. Okay. Well, uh, I appreciate all the commission members. And so we are now ready for a motion to adjourn. Is there a motion to adjourn? And vice motion chair. Motion to adjourn. That's a proper motion and second. And without objection, we are adjourned. Adjourned. Thank you, everybody, and see you next time. This has been a service of the Metro National Network. If you would like to see this presentation again, or for more information about this and other programs, visit Nashville.gov.